let me know when we're good to go. You're good to go, Barb. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I am going to call um, to order our planning committee meeting of April 14th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Um, I am going to confirm that I think we have everybody present. Who are we missing? We're missing one. Um, are we not? Thanks, Lord Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Kelly, uh, who we haven't heard anything, so I suspect he'll be along in a, in a few minutes. I also want to confirm that our CAO and Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability and other members of our, of our senior staff are present. Um, so uh, public input for the agenda was invited at planning at muskokalakes.ca. And as we go through these applications, our planners will be acknowledging um, those emails that came in or other comments that came in. And uh, barring the fact that they came in late yesterday or the day before, they have all been distributed to um, all of our counselors who I know diligently read everything. So uh, this today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. So uh, unusual for us, but today we actually don't have a supplementary agenda. So I'm going to move right on. Welcome, Councillor Kelly. I'm going to move right on to um, disclosure of pecuniary interest. Anybody have any disclosures? No? All right. Um, and our, our invited delegations are all this afternoon. That would be Port uh, Side Fusion and then the Lateos and also Mr. Sept, just to acknowledge them, but they'll be in, in our afternoon meeting. So I believe, Mr. Soya, we're up with our first, uh, first application. And that would be Mr. Knight. Welcome, Mr. Soya, and take it away. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, the first application today to be heard, or the first applications, are uh, applications B13821ML and ZBA6221 in the name of Knight. The subject property is located in the community of Torrance at 1006 uh, and 1014 Torrance Road. The property has road frontage on both Torrance Road, which is a township maintained road, and on Muskoka Road 169, which is maintained by the District of Muskoka. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted consent sketch, zoning sketch, and concept plan, starting on page 27 of this morning's agenda package. Uh, the purpose and effect of the applications is to create one lot and to rezone the retained lot to permit highway commercial uses and to permit the severed lot to be undersized. Uh, so more specifically, um, it's proposed that the retained lot be rezoned from Community Residential Private Services, R3, to the Community Commercial Highway, C4 zone. It is proposed that the severed lot, which contains a dwelling and accessory structures, remain in the Community Residential R3 zone, where lot area and frontage requirements are one acre of area and 150 feet of lot frontage. However, in this case, the proposed severed lot uh, would have an area of 0 0.6 acres and 100.1 feet of lot frontage, and therefore exemptions to the minimum to these minimum requirements in the R3 zone are requested. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 20 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and nine submissions have been received to date. Six of these are agency comments which have been forwarded to committee for review in advance of today's meeting. Um, I'll provide a brief review um, summary. Uh, the first submission is from Nick Snyder advising uh, the township's chief building official advising that uh, the Development Services Division does not have any concerns. The second submission is from Sandy Boss, the Township's Septic Inspector, advising that 
area does exist on the retained lot for a sewage system for a moderate size development and that the location of the existing water well be verified to ensure the existing well is located on the proposed severed lot. The third submission is from Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, advising that the Public Works Department does not have any concerns. Uh, the fourth submission is from Eric Campbell, the Township's Interim Fire Prevention Officer, advising that under ideal conditions, response time uh, to a fire is 10 minutes and that there are no fire hydrants and torrents and therefore a tanker shuttle would be required in the event of a fire. The um, Next submission is from the District of Muskoka, advising that council should be satisfied that the proposed uses on the retained lot um, can be supported with individual on-site water and individual on-site sewage services. And as a condition of consent, the lands should be subject to an agreement with the District of Muskoka respecting the location of wells in relation to the district road. Uh, the sixth submission is from Bell Canada, in which they request an easement across the retained lot, measuring 1.5 meters on either side of existing buried uh, facilities. Three submissions have been received from members of the public, all of which are in support. The first is from David Kitchen, owner of the Torrance General Store, located on the adjacent corner at the intersection of Torrance Road and Muskoka Road 169. Um, Mr. Kitchen's submission reads, I would like to express my support for Greg Knight in his effort to develop a new commercial enterprise um, at 1006 and 1014 East Bay Road. As a local business owner of Field of Greens in Port Carling and now the new Torrance General in Torrance, I'm confident in and supportive of Greg Knight's ongoing effort to help revitalize our community, provide jobs, income tax, and many other benefits that flow to the members of our community, our visitors, and all Muskoka Lake stakeholders. Um, the second public submission is from Rob Clark, the owner of an abutting property located to the north of the subject lands. Mr. Clark's letter simply states that he is an abutting landowner and is in support. The third public submission is from Tim and Teresa Meadows, uh, waterfront property owners on Clear Lake, uh, which is located to the south of the subject lands on the south side of Muskoka Road 169. And their submission um, is brief, so I'll just uh, read it here. Teresa and I support the purpose and vision of this property as outlined in the proposal. It is good to see the town of Torrance recovering to its old glory with the vision of Greg and others. It has also been shown in past developments at the resort, um, which I believe refers to the resort on Clear Lake. Um, and it's, um, that Greg is most interested in maintaining environmental standards while injecting a vibrancy to the area not seen before. So staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. For the severance application, staff have recommended approval subject to several conditions of consent. Number one, that a registrable description of the severed lot and any required rights of way be submitted to the secretary treasurer along with a registered copy of the reference plan. Number two, that confirmation be received that the township is satisfied that the severed and retained lots will be serviced by separate individual water wells located on the same properties that they will be servicing. Number three, that confirmation be received that entrance permits from the district of Muskoka and or the township's public works department are available as may be required for entrances along the abutting roadways. Uh, number four, that zoning approval be obtained to recognize the proposed undersized severed lot. And uh, staff would also recommend that an additional condition be added to address the recent request from Bell for an easement. Uh, however, as the applicant is still discussing the need for this easement with Bell, I would suggest that the condition include the words, if necessary, so that the requirement can be waived if Bell decides that the, that the easement is indeed not necessary. Staff have also recommended that the zoning bylaw amendment application be approved, but that it be subject to several minor amendments. Firstly, that the maximum effluent flows on the retained lot be restricted to 4,500 liters per day. Uh, this is due to the location in a community where municipal water and sewer services are not available and in the absence of a hydrogeological study. Uh, number two, that the main uses in the community commercial highway C4 zone 
on the retained lot be restricted by prohibiting the automobile, automobile washing establishment use and the contractor's yard use. The, um, and then lastly, um, staff had recommended that a minor amendment be required to limit the density of motel units to six units per acre. The applicant uh, had provided a concept plan which is also attached to today's agenda and which shows a potential site plan involving the construction of a 12 unit motel. While the concept plan has been provided for information purposes only, staff had suggested a restriction on the gross density of, hotel, uh, of motel units. Um, yeah, so I may have misspoke earlier. I, I should have been saying motel, not hotel. So it's a, a restriction, staff had suggested a restriction on the gross density of motel units as a result of an official plan policy, which directs that the gross density for resort commercial development in the community designation shall not exceed six units per acre. However, staff have had further discussions with the applicant and agree that the official plan specifically makes a dis distinction between uses that cater to the vacationing public and uses that cater to the traveling public and further that the resort um, commercial development policies in the official plan apply to those uses which specifically cater to the vacationing public. So since the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw specifically defines a motel as a use that caters to the traveling public, not the vacationing public, the resort commercial density provision would not apply to the development of a motel on this property and therefore a minor amendment to restrict the number of motel units through a zoning bylaw amendment is no longer recommended by staff. Uh, I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, I believe Mr. Zerbach is here as the agent and I don't know whether Mr. Knight would like to speak to Elizabeth. So why don't we bring them both in? And we'll have Mr. Zerbach. I think he's just coming in now. There he is. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. And please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Stefan Sherbach, uh, Planscape, 104 Kimberly Avenue in Bracebridge, P1L1Z8. I'm here today representing the owner, Greg Knight, and he is available to address the committee if there are any questions uh, that I can, uh, cannot answer. Um, I fully read the staff report, agree with their planning analysis related to the severance and the zoning, including the revision that Mr. Soya had just mentioned at the end of um, his presentation. I don't want to repeat anything uh, mentioned by Mr. Soya or the information contained in the report, but I would like to just suggest a few key considerations prior to the committee making their assessment and decision. Um, number one, um, as indicated in, in, um, in the report and also indicated on the plans, there, there are a number of three separate undersized lots that have been consolidated over time. And this severance uh, has been submitted to separate two existing and legal uses that are currently contained on the subject lot. Although um, the severed lot, the residential lot, may not meet the area and frontage requirements, the official plan specifically permits reduced standards uh, in this situation when separating these uses. There are a number of tests that are required when making an assessment, and more importantly, it's just to ensure that the resultant configuration is in character with the surrounding neighborhood. Taking a close look at the location map contained on Schedule I of the proposed bylaw, it's very clear that there are a lot of um, existing undersized developed lots in the immediate community. And in fact, the subject, um, proposal will create lots that are much larger than uh, what currently exists today. Uh, I would like to note that the reduced standards, again, only apply to the residential portion of the severance. The commercial portion fronting along the highway fully complies with the bylaw standards. The concurrent zoning um, also obviously addresses the undersized uh, severed lot. And um, the property adds a new commercial use to the four corners of Torrance. Um, clearly this property has great exposure along the highway. It has safe access from the local road. And more importantly, the official plan permits a good mix of commercial and residential uses that help serve uh, this established community as well as serving the surrounding waterfront community. There are many economic development policies that um, would apply in this instance and encourage this proposal. 
Um, fourth point is that the applications also uh, have the effect of improving the property. There's a derelict dwelling and a garage. Um, this will revitalize this, this um, high visible corner property. And the fifth and final point is that all other bylaw provisions will be met um, subject to committee's uh, approval or consideration of the rezoning application. It's my professional opinion that the application follows the intent and purpose of the official plan and represents good planning. Um, I fully support the minor change suggested by Mr. Sawyer related to the zoning application. Uh, I fully support the conditions indicated under the severance. And uh, again, um, thank you very much for addressing the bell comments and the if required is a, a, an absolute good indication because I think there's some back and forth with bell and the status of the, the services, the bell services that exist or probably do not function on the subject property. So um, the conditions are appropriate and the change is also appropriate. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Zivak. So I'm gathering, Mr. Knight, you're just going to answer questions if we need them answered. Just um, yeah. sure. I, I I might just add that I did have the opportunity to speak with all of our neighbors in this regard. The three commercial properties adjacent to the proposed property, as well as the residential. Uh, neighbors behind. So I, I know some of them have sent in letters of support. I think there are a couple more that I didn't, that I thought would be there. Haven't heard anything negative from anybody. So I think the proof is in the pudding there. Other than that, um, you know, I just, I'd like to mention after nearly four years on the economic development committee, um, just sort of highlighting aspects of, of that, that this is exactly the kind of development that we've been talking about uh, within the township's, township's economic development strategy, off water development that supports um, the lake community and the, and the resident community generally. Um, I, I don't know how your app works, but I, I did want to acknowledge that we have six members of our senior staff here listening to the meeting as well, um, which I, I just wanted to um, note that, um, you know, we are very much a, a growing and substantial business here in Torrance. And we've got some great people. I think you'll recognize a lot of their names if you, if you can see them on here. And um, it's just sort of a testament to, uh, to what we're doing in Torrance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, is there anyone else who would like to speak on behalf of this application that you can see? We've got one. Okay, let's bring them in. And this is, I assume, Ms. Buck. Hello, thank you everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes we can. Can you turn your video on, Ms. Buck? Um, certainly. Thank you. Okay, so please just give us your name and address and then your comment. Sure. Uh, Brenda Buck. Um, I have a property at 1020 Clear Lake Road, number three, which is immediately adjacent to Mr. Knight's um, beer spa. Um, my comments are as follows, and, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, while I certainly um, support appropriate development within Muskoka, um, I have several um, fairly significant safety concerns regarding this application. Um, as, as has been stated, uh, the property in question is across Highway 169. Um, I have no doubt that Mr. Knight will promote the adjacency to his beer spa, brewery and restaurant um, as attributes for this application, um, as well as access to Clear Lake through the 84 foot waterfront property um, immediately adjacent to me. Um, my safety concerns are first and foremost, um, that there are regularly very intoxicated parties 
going on at that property and people would be crossing Highway 169 to get to those properties. So in, in my opinion, that's a significant safety concern, uh, both for those individuals residing or um, visiting the motel and for motorists in the area. Um, there have been several uh, quite serious accidents at that corner over the years. Um, and this would just exacerbate that problem in my opinion. Secondly, I'm concerned for my personal safety. Um, I have regularly had trespassers from that property on my property. Um, I have had um, exchanges, belligerent exchanges with some of those uh, trespassers. Um, I have had them peering in my windows and testing the doors. I have had property stolen from my property. Um, and I have woken up to find empty, an empty beer bottle sitting on the railing um, of my porch to my immediately in front of my kitchen door. Um, so we have, I have those concerns already. And by adding to the density of that property, I'm concerned that those problems will be exacerbated. Ms. Buck, you have about two minutes and you're just about at your limit. So, okay, that's okay. fair. And, and the last comment I have is I've, con I have concern for Clear Lake. Um, it's an 84 foot waterfront property um, that Mr. Knight has. There are regularly parties with over 40 people present in the water and regularly there are people urinating in the lake and washing in the lake. Okay. Those are okay, my comments. That, that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. All right. So I see, um, thank you, Ms. Buck. I see Elizabeth, we have um, Ms. Leslie also, who would like to, I think, come in and speak. Good morning, Ms. Leslie. Good morning. Very nice to see everybody. Uh, Ooh, this is so exciting. I, I, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll only take uh, a few seconds, but I just want to say um, as past chair of Muskoka Tourism for many years and with my deep and personal involvement in the tourism industry in Muskoka, I'm so delighted to see this happening. Um, I hope it's uh, been a pleasure for the last couple of months for me to work with the team at uh, Clear Lake Brewing Company and Muskoka Beer Spa in uh, developing an attraction that is something that Muskoka sorely needs. We need this kind of interesting, unique and um, uh, well, sustainable, <laughs> particularly sustainable attraction. I've been observing the work that the team has done to make sure that the entire operation is uh, environmentally responsible, socially responsible, and that the business is a contributor to the community's health and prosperity. And um, I, I know the site, I've seen uh, the, the plan for what's, what's uh, proposed here. And I just wanted to voice my enthusiastic support because I think it's a fantastic uh, concept, uh, a very, um, as I say, a very sustainable one. I think it will stay, it will grow uh, responsibly and will be a, a terrific contribution to the community. Okay, thank you. Can I just get your name? Uh, well, we have your name, but your address just for the record, please. Yeah, Lee Leslie. I live at 11 White Birch Drive in Seguin Township. Okay, thank you, Ms. Leslie. All right, so thank you. Thank you. So um, we all, we, have already had the opposition. So I think those are the two inputs. So Mr. Zerbach, you have the opportunity to respond to that uh, if you would choose to before I turn it over to committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think just, just briefly, I mean, the, the business itself is separate from the resort. We know that the owners are you know, clearly um, similar owners, um, but whatever is happening at the resort, I think really should not be taken into consideration what's in front of you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, committee, Mayor Hardy, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Serbeck and Mr. Knight, thank you. Uh, I'll have to say, I, I love what's going on in Torrance. I love the growth. 
um, might slow down a little bit because a couple more developments, we're going to have to put a new sewer and water treatment plant in there to uh, manage all your developments. So um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I think overall, this is great. I have two questions of staff and one specific to Mr. Knight um, or Mr. Surbeck uh, based on uh, Ms. Buck's comment. Um, number one, from a uh, hotel, motel, uh, restriction capability where we've talked about potentially restricting the number of units. The one thing our um, Mr. Boss, I believe, has said is that we only want 4,500 liters of uh, septic a day going through there. Um, will whatever motel development be sustainable on that? And, you know, do does that get restricted on the number of rooms that are available? Uh, so that would sort of be to our staff. Are we appropriate on the right number? Um, to control that. And then uh, the other question I have for staff, the bell easement. And I, I'm wondering why we're getting involved in a property matter between Bell Canada and an individual property. We all have certain easements. We may have hydro easements. We may have bell easements across our property. Is that not a matter specifically between uh, Mr. Knight and Bell Canada? Um, and if they want to put an easement on later on, that's their ability to do so, but I'm not sure it really has anything to do with Township of Muskoka Lake specifically. So I'll ask that second one of staff. And then my final comment to Ms. Uh, Buck's comment or question regarding uh, the resort on Clear Lake. Is there an ability, because it's nice to say, here, come stay at the motel, and if you want to have lake access, walk across the street, utilize the resort. Will we be restricting motel guests from Clear Lake? And if I hear yes, that they're not going to be permitted to access, but if I hear they are going to be permitted to access, uh, I have to agree that there's a safety concern because it is a very short walk between the two. And I uh, really like to uh, understand that a little bit more. So I'll go to staff questions first, and then hopefully uh, Mr. Surbeck or Knight can talk to me about restrictions on Clear Lake. Okay, so I have both Mr. Sharp and Mr. Soya um, up. So, Mr. Sharp, it looks like you would like to start. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, uh, through you, and thank you, uh, Mayor Harding, for your questions, and good morning, uh, Planning Committee, uh, Mr. Sherback and uh, Mr. Knight. Uh, with response to the uh, first question from the Mayor, uh, Policy D 6.4.6 of the Township's official plan, would require a hydrogeological study for any commercial development producing an effluent flow greater than 4,500 liters per day, which is why the staff have implemented the restriction or had have recommended the, the restriction on effluent flow in the, uh, the site-specific bylaw in front of you uh, as a minor amendment. So that's where that is coming from. And Mr. Knight, who is who I understand is a licensed septic system installer, has provided a letter indicating that um, uh, any proposed development on the property in the future would be uh, in compliance with that requirement. And of course, uh, if approved, the site-specific bylaw will become applicable law under the Ontario Building Code. So when Mr. Knight goes to to um, apply for a building permit that would uh, be reviewed by the Township's Development Services Division and um, there would be a requirement to comply with the bylaw itself. With respect to the uh, second question from the Mayor uh, about uh, the Bell easement, um, under the Planning Act, Bell is a quote-unquote agency that we do circulate uh, for comments. Um, in my experience, uh, Bell has only recently started um, um, submitting uh, responses or comments back to the township when we circulate them uh, for comments. So this is something that's relatively new um, and they have been um, providing comments as of late with respect to some of our planning applications um, where an application may um, affect their interests related to a property. And I think the recommendation that Mr. Soya has made to include the wording of if necessary on the condition would allow conversations to occur between Bell and Mr. Knight uh, with respect to the necessity of uh, any requirements for an easement. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, the question and uh, through you, Chair Bridgman, I'll pass it over to, to you for a response from Mr. Knight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Knight, or Mr. Zerbeck, probably Mr. Knight. Sure, I can speak to that, thanks. Um, um, 
I just maybe would, I, I thank you if I can address the bell issue briefly as well. Thanks, Mayor Harding. I was surprised to read this letter from Bell, which basically said, you know, we're going to require this and you are going to pay for it. I didn't think that that was uh, typical of, uh, of of something in this circuit of a of a utility in this circumstance. The wires that we're talking about bisect a, a tree with a diameter of about 16 inches. I don't think the wires are working anymore, but I guess they can have a look at that. But um, you know, if unless it's Unless it is customary that you include that, I think that it'd be useful to use those words if necessary, because I think they're going to find that it that it isn't. Um, with respect to uh, concerns about motel users using the lakefront, that that's not something that we are considering. It's not something we're looking at. It's not something that we even allow our our current uh, spa day users. We 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 don't. It, it's it's only for that limited number of uh, overnight guests that we have on the, on, on the resort property. That's the way it will be promoted. Um, I live at the waterfront, 60 feet from Miss Buck. I don't have an interest in there being more people there. Uh, frankly, you know, uh, the reason why we're doing this is that, you know, we used to do a great business in uh, with out-of-town contractors, Hydro One, CN Rail, those kinds of guys on a year-round basis. They, they were what keep, kept our lights on. When we made our investments in the resort infrastructure and put our rates up at the resort, it, it got it, we lost that market. And uh, while that's okay, we intended to do that on the accommodation side, but the problem was that all, those guys are also the guys that are spending 30 and 40 or 50 dollars a night in our bar in November when nobody else is. And so part of the uh, can, part of the impetus for this is you know these are truly um, people who get up and go to work in the morning and they're they're here at seven o'clock at night and they're here for three days and then they're back to to their home towns. So that, that's the motivation. Uh, I do share concerns about the intersection. We've voiced those for years. I thank this council for directing a study in that regard, um, which is going to take place this summer. Um, but um, yeah, that's, I, 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 I'm comfortable with it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Zavitz. Sorry, Madam Chair, just to supplement oh, on that sorry. topic, if I may, thank you. I apologize. Maybe then understand that it's not going to be used in conjunction. Maybe staff could craft something in the zoning bylaw amendment that would put a restrictive covenant that the property cannot be marketed in tandem with Clear Lake type of comment. I'm not sure what the wording would be, but as Mr. Nice says, it's not going to be used that way. So I don't think then there would be an objection to put some language in there that it is a separate entity and not to be uh, used in conjunction with. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Knight, you're good with that? Absolutely. I mean, we envision this as its own business entity. Your zoning bylaw requires independent on-site management on that property over there. It's going to operate very differently. Uh, to, to suggest that there will not ever be people who uh, stay there who go to the spa would be overstepping and not something that would be realistic. But uh, they certainly will not be using the waterfront. And that, that is something we're pursuing now, even in the design of the spa. That site plan came to you quite some time ago now, but if you, if you would recall, we have literally fenced off the back five acres of the resort property and directed traffic away from the waterfront. We've done all sorts of things to direct traffic away from the waterfront in this project, um, like it's so opposite of what everybody does here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and through you, uh, this will be the emotional, Glenn. Um, this is a halcyon moment for, uh, for Torrance, and I, I think, um, and I appreciate the mayor's comments, certainly, and, and the mayor ticked off a lot of the boxes that I, of some of the, uh, the questions I had. I wouldn't call them concerns, but certainly questions. Thanks for those. Um, you know, I, I just want to wax poetic for just a second here. When my grandfather arrived here in 1905, there was very little here. There was not even any trees. They'd been removed most of those. 
And, and over the years, Torrance grew and there was grocery stores, a post office, a train station, obviously the uh, royalty was here, as we all know. And in those late 50s, we had a dance hall, uh, a, a roller rink, uh, you know, a, a highway. And then the highway by bypassed Torrance and, and gradually and slowly and but inevitably uh, Torrance shrunk to essentially place where people live. And that was it. And these, these derelict buildings have been waiting for years for someone like Mr. Knight. So while I know Torrance really well, I don't know Greg as well, but I certainly appreciate his business acumen and his attention to, to detail as it relates to the, as I heard it said by Sam earlier, the four corners of Torrance. I totally champion this and will, you know, I, I just think it's the greatest thing to happen to uh, this part of the, the township of Muskoka Lakes in a long, long time. And uh, I certainly welcome uh, Mr. Knight's efforts and we'll do whatever I can, Greg, to support you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before I go to Councilman Ishikawa, I, Ms. Buck, I want to explain to you that you, you are not part of this conversation. If someone directs a question to you, you, you can answer it, but you, you, you're not an integral part of our committee. So just that's all procedural. I just wanted to let you know that because I see your hand up. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I think my question will go through you to staff. Um, Greg sort of mentioned it. We, we've had a problem on Torrance Road for many, many years. And I know that I've spoken with five different director of public works at our township about this situation and there was promises that something was going to be done. But the fact is when you turn off of 169 onto Torrance Road, you're almost into their yard if you were to do this properly. And it, it's, it's a very, I don't understand, um, like we need to f find a way to create some form of, 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 of a sidewalk or walking, you know, we, sometimes are lucky if some of the brush gets uh, taken off uh, by the CN rail, rail lines, but the safety of the community has never been addressed and it needs to be addressed because I actually see that there is a possibility that um, people could you know, come from the motel and use our public dock, our public park. We have multiple public parks actually in the area. And again, I'm not sure where staff's comments will be on, in fact, improving that road and improving the, the safety of, of people walking in that area. I, I really think we have to address that issue. It's not about the developer trying to build, you know, overpasses and all of these grand things. It really is the township has not stepped up for, you know, 30 years that I'm aware of. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if that could be part of the discussion through public works, um, no, no answers today, but it is a very serious concern. Um, I would say that if you're turning a little bit too fast off of, um, sorry, going a left-hand turn uh, onto Torrance Road from Bala, you're, you're likely going to veer onto this property very closely, or, or at least you'll hit, hit the whatever, mailbox is sitting there you know i'm just saying that so i hope our staff are going to take this uh, a little more seriously that our, our our downtown core should be addressed uh, and clean up some of those areas um along with that though i i also noted that you know we we had approached district about this as well and district wasn't clear at the time of whether those trees were there, but further down, um, and I think it's on the property, Greg, you can correct me or not, but there's a lot of overhanging brush that makes some of the um, sight lines on 169 challenging as well. Uh, and, and that's just because of the hills in the area. And so when people are coming from Gravenhurst, if I was to say, um, you, you, you don't actually almost see their vehicle when they're coming over the hill, depending on what, on the tree growth and things. So it's just some of those kinds of things. They're, they're not the responsibility of the developer, but our township needs to be more aware of those situations and, and get, get them corrected. Um, I did note that 
the uh, I have a little bit of concern um, with the answer about the six units. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not a septic installer, so I am not sure how much alf affluent. It would be a shame if it was just six units because um, I, I, I just see that it can be filled on a regular basis. If we look at Dudley Inn, um, you can never get a room there. Uh, and and I, I would hope that six units, I think that's that's too small, but again, I don't know the math or the science behind, behind the septics. Um, and I think mostly what, it, what I want, as I said, I'm really more concerned about what our township's gonna do to, to make this a safe area to walk and, and ingress. Thank you. Okay, I think that I don't think there was a question there, um, except I believe that in, in um, Mr. Sawyer's report, planning committee does agree that that uh, 12 units, the, the limitation of six units is not necessary anymore. So uh, before I ask uh, Director Pink to do his minor changes to this um, application with the if necessary for Bell, can I get a agreement from um, from our committee that we are not going to put in that restriction of six motel units? Have I got agreement on that? I, I do. Okay, so uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, first of all, I do think from an economic development standpoint, this is very exciting and it is the kind of thing that we need. I found this to be interesting on a personal level because I didn't clearly understand the difference that a motel falls under traveling public versus a hotel. So that was a good one to understand today. Um, I do I, I do want clarification uh, um, picking up on Ms. Buck's concerns about safety. And uh, we recently uh, directed or asked the district to do an actual uh, traffic study on, uh, in this particular area. And it sounds like it's happened in the summer. And I was just wondering from staff, um, if we could just hear from them exactly what's involved with that study. And I guess the second part to that, is it going to pick up some of the other thoughts that Councillor Nishikawa was just picking, uh, talking about, which was sight lines, et cetera. So uh, just some clarification on exactly what that study will include. And this is largely so that everybody that's on this call right now understands what's happening this summer. Okay, so we are going to answer that. And then I think we're going to refocus strictly on what's in front of us. Thanks. Very, very good, I, good I, conversation, but okay. So let's yeah. get that clarified. Um, Thank you. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, through you, and thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Mazan. I'm not, I'm not aware of any specific um, studies being undertaken. I would defer to Mr. Pink uh, if he's aware of anything. I'm noticing that we don't have anyone from our Public Works Department um, on the meeting today, but I would just note that we have received uh, comments uh, from both uh, the district's Public and Engineering Work uh, Department and the Public Works Department. Um, there's no objections being stated by uh, either the district or the township's public works department. Um, so those were just the comments that I wanted to make. And I would just uh, remind committee as well that the, uh, the commercial development um, in the future would be subject to the township's uh, site plan control process as well. So there'd be further discussions that could be had at, at that point uh, regarding um, any site specific uh, development proposal um, that may be uh, brought forward at that time. Thank you. Thank That's you. Thing. You have yeah, another thank one. You. Well, it's not, it's it's just a follow up. I just wanted to be sure that Miss Buck knew that we are, have been listening and part of these conversations have been ongoing. Um, so uh, that was it. But generally speaking, I'm I'm supportive of this from an economic development standpoint. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that that whole safety part move over to Public Works, and uh, I think um, Chair Zavitz can decide if he wants to get that on his next agenda. So, okay, so um, I have, we, uh, I think we're going to craft the motions. Mr. Pink is going to do the, the uh, amendments to those motions. And, and because I'm remote today, I'm going to ask him to read that motion. It's easier than trying to get it to me as, as we all know if you're doing things remotely. So if there's no other discussion, I have, um, I don't know whether 
Councillor um, or Mr. Pink is ready yet, but I believe what what I can do is do the first motion and then the second one will refer to the changes that we've made. So uh, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that planning committee recommends to Township Council that consent application B slash 138 slash 21 slash ML night be approved subject to the following conditions. That a registerable description of the severed lot and any required rights of way be submitted to the secretary treasurer along with a registered copy of the reference uh, plan. That confirmation be received that the township is satisfied that the severed and retained lots will be serviced by separate individual water wells located on the same properties that they will be servicing. The confirmation be received that entrance permits from the district municipality of Muskoka and or the township's public works department be available as may be required for entrances along Torrance Road and or Muskoka Road 60, 169 and that zoning approval be obtained to recognize the proposed undersized severed lot. Any discussion? All in favor? Madam Clerk, that carries. Hold on, hold on. Okay, we're holding on. Did we need to change something on this, Lauren? We can put hands down, just. Thank you, committee. Uh, through the chair, I believe uh, that uh, condition did not, or that resolution did not include the bell condition as it was just, I think, received very recently. If you give me just one moment, I can uh, write that up and uh, read it to you. Okay, I thought it was on the, on the other one, David. <laughs> <laughs> no, the other one is the zoning amendment, and um, I believe you have two options in front of you, and you should read the one that does not include the limitation on the number of units. And uh, I will add the if necessary wording to the bell condition, and I just need one moment to uh, write up that condition. Sorry. Thank you. There's that team that I really need right with me. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I yes. may. Yes. Thank you. Just as we're doing this again, I brought up the question about Bell. I realize that they're now asking for this, but I still wonder or question our authority in imposing this because it, it seems to me this is a private property matter between the applicant and Bell. And I, I understand it's if necessary, but if Bell wants an easement across their property, to me, it's between Bell and the property owner. And I'm not sure why we are doing Bell's work or we're asking the applicant to potentially pay for or have any issues with Bell's work. If Bell wants to have a specific easement, Bell can compensate the property owner. Property owner may say, I don't want Bell across my property. And then they can go down that road. But I don't think that has anything to do with the municipality or any of our specific services. It's not like the District of Muskoka where we have uh, water or sewer lines that go in certain areas and we request those kind of easements. Um, so I'm just, I, I appreciate it's if required, but I don't even think we as a municipality should be requiring this, that the easement is already there. They're already using Mr. Knight's property. If Bell wants to legalize it, let them do it at another date. That's my perspective. So I don't think we need to add the clause in this particular case, but I will defer to the rest of the committee in this particular fact. Well, it sort of gets the question as to, um, well, I see Director Pink's here. Why are they part of the list of people we're supposed to ask, right, Mr. Pink? Thank you, Chair. Uh, as, as Mr. Sharp noted, uh, Bell Canada, along with a number of other agencies, are standard uh, agencies that are circulated on these planning applications, and they can request an easement. Uh, it's fairly uncommon in our township. I think it may be more common elsewhere uh, as the mayor's pointed out i don't think you're under any uh, obligation uh, to grant it uh, you could choose to waive it uh, but i believe they have the right to, to request that 
I have it crafted. You can either vote uh, as you've read it now without, or I'm happy to read the added condition. I'd like to committee for direction. Okay, well, I happen to be with Mayor Harding. I don't think we need to get involved in this. So who would like to leave Bell right out of this? Can I get a, okay. And uh, Councillor Jagowitz, before we go farther, do you have a comment? I did, thank you, Chair. I merely, uh, our request was when we talk about Bell, are we referring to telephone or are we referring to broadband? Just wondered since our focus seems to be to assisting uh, IP partners, uh, maybe it could be a clarification there. Well, I don't think any of us here can probably clarify that. I think it's Bell Services. Um, and if we've just decided that we're not going to get involved with it, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure the answer is necessary, Councillor Jagwell. I, 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 I like your thought process, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Just to add to this, um, fiber optics into Torrance. Uh, this is a corner lot. I don't know the area, but maybe Bell's, we, we can't, uh, uh, but we, they could use that for fiber optics. So, so just a thought, but, but it could stay out and let them, it's a property thing. Mr. Knight, would you let us know if you get fiber into Torrance? Because we have a hard time finding out from our suppliers where they've actually got it in. <laughs> uh, I would be thrilled to give Bell an easement if we had fiber in our property here. This is a, this is a line that's buried six inches underground. Um, it was identified by our surveyor. This is, it's been a, it's a desktop review that's been done by the Bell clerk that receives these notices from every municipality in the province. This is not an issue of municipal concern. I thank Mayor Harding for his point. I mean, I don't, if it's required, how do I, how, I can fulfill every one of these other conditions in a month, but I, 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 I don't know whether we'll even hear from Bell before then about whether they decide whether it's, it's appropriate or not. I did send them a picture of the wire going through the middle of the tree that's grown up around it. So, I mean, I, I hear you. Anyway, I think we've we have decided we're not going to put that in. Director Pink, do you have something to add? Just to clarify, I don't uh, want to uh, belabor the discussion, but the uh, the letter from Bell Canada states for a um, three. Let me just find the wording here. It's for a uh, utility line, I believe, three meters, as defined in the Ontario Energy Board Act, nineteen ninety eight. Just so uh, the applicant or committee are familiar with the process, it should not delay. Uh, the property will have to be surveyed uh, regardless, and the, uh, the easement in favor of Bell will just have to be surveyed. And then it's largely administrative legal work uh, from there in the consent certificates to include the easement. Uh, but again, if committees decided uh, they don't wish to include it, uh, that's fine. I believe you've read the motion then uh, and can recall the vote if you've put your hands down. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Director Pink. Okay. So I've read the motion. All in favor? Madam Clerk, we're good. Okay. All right. Moved by Councillor Zavitt, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment ZBA 62 slash 21 night rolls number 6-5-002, 6-5-003, and 6-5-005 be approved subject to the following minor amendments that maximum affluent flows on the retained lot be restricted to 4,500 liters per day, and that the main uses of automobile washing establishment and contractor's yard in the commercial uh, community commercial highway C4 zone on the retained lot be prohibited. Any discussion? All in favor? Madam Clerk, that Carries. carries. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Knight, Mr. Uh, Mr. Zeebach. And so we are now going to move on to McNeil and Alexander, which I believe is Ms. Walker. Welcome, Ms. Walker. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and good morning, everyone. The first applications or the next applications to be heard are consent applications B slash 135 slash 136 slash 137 21 ML and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 14 slash 22 bylaw 2022 
56 in the name of McNeil and Alexander. The subject property is known municipally as 1100 Torrance Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted consent sketch and zoning sketch on page 62 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the applications is summarized as follows. Consent applications B-135-136-137-21 ML have been submitted to create three new lots in addition to the retained lot. The proposed zoning bylaw is to provide an exemption from section 5.1.3 of 2014-14 being the provisions pertaining to the community residential private services R3 zone. The applicants propose to require a 100 foot setback from the edge of a wetland. The 100 foot setback will apply to building structures on severed lot two and three and the retained lot. The purpose of the zoning bylaw is also to provide an exemption from section 5.1.3 and 11.96 of bylaw 2014-14 being the minimum lot frontage requirement of 150 feet in a community residential R3 zone and the definition of, front lot, of a front lot line for an interior lot being a street. The retained lot abuts two streets. The front lot line of the retained lot is proposed to be the lot line abutting King Street and the minimum lot frontage is proposed to be 66 feet. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and six submissions have been received to date. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, Eric Campbell, the Township's Interim Fire Protection Officer, Sandy Boss, Township Septic Inspector, the District Municipality of Muskoka, and Bell Canada. All submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. I prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval, staff have recommended that consent application B-135-136-137-21 ML McNeil and Alexander be per approved, subject to the following. One, that a registerable description of the severed lots and any required rights of ways be submitted to the secretary treasurer along with a registered copy of the reference plan. Two, that cash in lieu of parkland be dedicated to the township in the amount of 5% of the assessed value of the newly created vacant lots or the entire subject lands, whichever is less. Three, that a consent agreement be entered into with the township under section 5126 of the Planning Act, wherein the owner of each lot agrees to implement the recommendations of the wetland assessment prepared by Riverstone Environmental Solutions Incorporated dated December 7th, 2021. This agreement is to be registered on title. Four, that confirmation be received that entrance permits are available for each lot. And five, that exemptions from the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 be approved to, one, implement a 100 foot setback from the wetland boundary delineated by Riverstone Environmental Solutions Incorporated. Two, to define the front lot line of the retained lot and three, to permit the retained lot to have a 66 foot frontage, whereas the minimum of 150 foot lot frontage is required. Staff have recommended that ZBA 14 slash 22 bylaw 2022 56 Alexander and McNeil be approved. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. All right, I see uh, Mr. Gallagher is the agent and I see Ms. Alexander here. I not sure if Mr. McNeil is here, so. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. John P. Gallagher, John P. Gallagher and Associates, uh, 24 Hibbard Road, Huntsville, P18-1C9. And I believe uh, Bob McNeil and Ellen Alexander are standing by as well. I have uh, Mike Francis and Al Shaw from Riverstone Environmental. Uh, with respect to the application, we started this process uh, last year and had our pre-consultation meeting with staff. Staff uh, raised the issue of the uh, wetland that was on the east side of the property and asked us to provide a wetland evaluation. As such, uh, we had Riverstone engaged to look at uh, that issue, define the boundary in conjunction with the surveyor, and uh, through the study, uh, Riverstone has uh, put forth a recommendation to protect uh, the wetland through the imposition of a 100 foot uh, buffer adjacent to uh, the boundary. The property is within the community of uh, Torrance and uh, meets the criteria established in the official plan. Uh, my clients are recently uh, 
finalizing construction of their retirement home on the severed lot one. And uh, one of their sons hopes to build on the property as well. The, uh, there have been no uh, objections to the application. Uh, we have reviewed uh, the staff recommendations on pages one and two of the staff report, and we have no objection to the imposition of the uh, conditions as outlined in the report. All the lots have ample area for a building septic and well. Um, and again, this is a uh, Within communities is where the province, the district, and uh, local municipality envision uh, growth, and we've tried to best meet the criteria of the official plans for the area. Uh, I think that's it for now. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Riverstone's also here if there's some specific questions, and uh, the Alexander uh, and McNeils are here as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Okay, so um, Elizabeth, have you seen anyone who would like to support this application? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you. How about in opposition to? Not seeing any opposition either. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn this over to committee then. And committee, any questions on this? Councillor Hayes. Yes, thank you. Through you, I just have a couple. Um, the environmental portion, uh, we all know how important wetlands are to um, our watershed. It, was there any thought given to um, donating the wetland to the township in lieu of the parkland cash payment? Um, so actually using it as a, a parkland donation rather than we've done that with a couple of other um, subdivisions where we've accepted land instead of the money. So I, I'm just wondering if any thought was given to that because it was um, mentioned in, in three of our agencies that how important it was. And the other question would be on the severed lot two. Um, if if the um, if they have to go 25 feet back in, are they going to be um, the the building envelope for a suburb lot two? I just want to make sure that that's not right in the backyard of the one that's built in in suburb lot one. So they're not looking in each other's back windows. If something could be adjusted there, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with respect to the dedication of the wetland. That's the first I've heard of that. Typically, uh, uh, municipalities uh, that I've dealt with uh, aren't uh, taking wetlands as parkland dedication. I believe the province is looking at uh, changing that uh, in their new act. Um, with regards to the building envelope for uh, the severed lot too, there's about 24,000 square feet of uh, building envelope and What's not sort of uh, shown on the plan there is there is a bit of a hillside in behind that house. And uh, if the dwelling were placed on the rear of the um, severed lot too, it would be blocked a lot further than if it were up beside it. So thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Savitz. Yeah, I did note that, uh, sorry, uh, Chair Bridgman, I did note that uh, Bryce had his hand up perhaps on that very point. So I'd be happy to stand back for a moment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on, uh, I guess, the township's perspective with respect to parkland uh, dedication. We do have a uh, policy in place with respect to uh, parkland dedications and typically where the municipality would require the actual dedication of parkland is where the, the lands are adjoining an existing you know, public park uh, that would benefit from additional lands or where there's a road allowance that leads to water that would benefit from uh, additional lands for public access to uh, a water body um, or where it's determined that um, uh, the area in which the severances are, are, are proposed would benefit from additional um, 
um, parkland. So I'm not sure, you know, a wetland, uh, definitely. I'm certainly on board uh, to protect it um, as per our recommendation, but uh, I'm not sure whether it really fits within the, um, the intent of uh, the policy guidance around parklands, given that it is a wetland and it wouldn't be suitable for um, what I would consider, uh, you know, public use or public, uh, public park. Um, so those would be my, uh, my comments in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, through you. Uh, I guess I have two points. First of all, um, yeah, I know the family. Uh, this family didn't sell their property and leave Torrance. They sold their property and bought into Torrance and they're developing in Torrance and that's brilliant. Uh, again, this is uh, beyond anyone's wildest dreams that this, uh, this this kind of opportunity is happening. It's it's just fabulous. Uh, I, I would want to say about the wetlands and it's, it's interesting because I have been very involved with uh, quite a few folks um, as it relates to Black Lake, which uh, adjoins uh, underneath the uh, Torrance Road and then feeds through to Clear Lake and, and eventually into Lake Muskoka. This wetland that we're talking about it is particularly, um, I wanna use the word fragile. Right now, there's a lot of water in it and uh, there was quite a beaver problem all the way throughout. In fact, the township Muskoka Lakes through our director, uh, Pen Ken Becking has been uh, quite brilliant with uh, working with the, the public, um, getting letters to everyone because it is not our mandate to, to remove beavers or manage them, but they are causing high water. And uh, I would suggest that some of the water on this property uh, you could probably walk on if, uh, if there wasn't this issue. So that's a sidebar and I don't want that to have anything to do with this, but it's something that the township of Muskoka Lakes, FYI, Ken Becking could speak to it if he were on the call, uh, would, would, would address. Uh, we're constantly out there every week cleaning out under the culverts under our road that we're responsible for and uh, Highway 169, uh, which we do on behalf of the district of Muskoka to keep the water flowing. So, um, Anyway, that's a sidebar, and I don't want it to confuse this issue, but it, it is a mandate of, of our township to, uh, you know, to work in that area on, on that, in that regard. So just FYI, thank you. Okay, hey, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a quick comment about the beaver situation. The, the beaver situation is... Um, so Kawa, and and Councillor Zavitz, I, it's really interesting, but it isn't to do with what's happening here today. It's actually happening in the community, Barb, and it makes, I'm, if you would allow me to finish my discussion, I well, would explain to you why this is important. I understand it's important, but it's not part of our planning so we're not going to have the discussion of whether we would like to take this land and protect it, our community. Sorry, you, I, you, I think you're reading something that I'm not. I'm just trying Could to I make please sure have the we... ability to speak. Yes, you may. What I wanted to mention was that it's a, it is important for our township to protect these wetlands. The beaver situation is not actually on this particular property. It is a result of many other property owners that are involved. I will tell you that it is an important area. This, this wetland has been, people stop by, there's an, an, an abundance of uh, birds and things in this wetland. And it is part of a park-like environment in our community. I hope that's a planning discussion, but more importantly, um, I noticed on page 11 of the staff report that they are requiring um, an imposed setback of 50 feet, whereas we just went through um, Mr. Knight's application where his setbacks on for a motel and, and even um, anyone else that's the building in the community, it's actually six feet setback and we're trying to impose a 50 foot setback. Um, I want to make sure that that is not part of the consideration. I'm only reading the staff report, so I don't know what other conversations have happened since then, but I think that's really punitive because um, 
again, that's 50 feet by whatever that people wouldn't, they couldn't put a shed on. Uh, that, that really concerns me. But I, I, again, I will take it differently that um, apparently I, I will have to address the parkland in con consideration in a different manner. And I will learn that manner and bring it back to the next meeting. I think that's an excellent idea. It is a good discussion, Councillor Nishikawa, but I think we need to do it elsewhere under its own topic. Uh, uh, Mayor Harding. Thank you very much. Just a question for staff perspective. You know, we've identified this as a wetland. Um, there's no development allowed within the wetland. Whether the township owns it or an individual owns the property, does that the fact that it's identified as a wetland in itself not protect the wetland? So it becomes moot, in my opinion, whether or not we own it or the property owner owns it or whatever, because there's no development allowed within that. So maybe staff can just confirm that. Thank you. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding, for your question. Um, yeah, there's a part of the wetland is zoned environmental protection EP1. And um, due to the wetland assessment, the actual boundary of the wetland appears to be slightly larger than what it's mapped EP1. And we're recommending that a hundred foot setback be imposed from the delineated uh, wetland boundary as it's been delineated by Riverstone. And that would prevent any new buildings or structures from being constructed within 100 feet of that delineated wetland boundary. And I also just, since I'm speaking, I'll take a moment to um, address Councillor Nishikawa's comment about uh, a 50 foot setback. Staff aren't recommending that, um, but we had just indicated um, in our report that that would be an option for committee if uh, you know the, the configuration of that one particular lot sandwich between the two residential lots was a concern. But I, you know, part of the reason we didn't recommend it is I would tend to agree with uh, Councillor Nishikawa, you know, the, the, this is a community area where um, densities are greater and uh, infill is encouraged. So those are just um, some considerations to note in that regard. And I see that Mr. Pink has his screen on, so he may wish to further elaborate. Thank you. Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair, uh, through you. I just wanted to quickly add that the reason, um, it's a very odd law configuration and the, the zoning bylaw would consider the, the uh, result lot line to be a side lot line, interior side. So it would result in a six foot setback, uh, but it doesn't really function as a side yard as the applicant noted, or I believe it was Councillor Hayes, that uh, future development might actually look at one another. Uh, so we're suggesting uh, more closely typical with a front yard or a rear yard to provide the appearance of a yard or a buffer between the two, as opposed to a six foot side yard that's typical in an urban setting. So hence uh, the suggestion that committee could consider a slightly increased, whether it's 25 or 50 feet. Um, and that's, uh, again, just wanted to clarify the difference between the six foot uh, and the increased. Uh, really the result lot line is not going to function as a typical interior side yard. The two buildings could uh, again, face each other more as a front yard. Hope that helps clarify. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, regarding the uh, wetland is uh, parkland, I think it would be uh, better protected if it stay private. If, it, if, if the township take it, then uh, people can be walking all over and actually disturbing it. So. Uh, if it's private, uh, they can't trespass. So uh, I'll leave it up to the uh, committee, but I, I, I would not take it as parkland. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think that question uh, for today, we have to make a decision on that. Um, it's not in front of us, but uh, good point. All right. Any other comments? I'm going to read the motion then. Uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council the consent applications B-135-136-137-21-M L-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-
or the entire subject lands, whichever is less, that a consent agreement be entered into with the township under section 5126 of the Planning Act, wherein the owner of each lot agrees to implement the recommendations of the wetland assessment prepared by Riverstone Environmental Solutions, Inc. and dated December 7th, 2021. This agreement is to be registered on title. The confirmation be received that entrance permits be available for each lot and that exemptions from the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 be approved to implement a 100 foot uh, setback from the wetland boundary delineated by Riverstone Environmental Solutions Inc. to define the front lot line of the retained lot and to permit the retained lot to have 66 feet of lot frontage whereas a minimum of 150 feet of lot covered uh, frontage is required. Any comments? All in favor? Madam Clerk. Carried. Okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by, by Mayor Harding. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that zoning bylaw amendment ZBA 14 22 McNeil and Alexander, roll number 6 5 095, be approved. Any comments? All in favor? Carried. Madam Clerk, that carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this is probably a natural place to take a 10 minute break before we start into our next application. So we'll see everybody back here at 1025.
Okay, if I could get everybody back, please. Okay, we're just waiting for our quorum here. There we go. Okay, Madam Clerk, we have quorum, so I think we're just going to carry on here. Uh, Elizabeth, we're good to go. Good to go. Okay, thank you. All right, our next application is uh, Brackenridge Road Partners, and I believe uh, Miss Walker is, is you again. Take it away. Richmond. All right, the next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA 64 slash 21 bylaw 2021-199 in the name of Brackenrig Road Partners. The subject property is known municipally as 1725 Brackenrig Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan and drawings beginning on page 120 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. The applicant proposes to demolish all of the existing buildings and structures on the property. The applicant proposes to construct a new dwelling to reconstruct within the same footprint of an accessory building identified as a sleeping cabin, to construct a new land-based sleeping cabin, and to construct a new two-story boathouse with a sleeping cabin in the upper level in an associated dock. The purpose of bylaw 2021-199 is to provide the following exemptions. An exemption from section 3.2A of bylaw 2014-14 is amended, which prohibits a dwelling or a sleeping cabin from being increased in floor area on a lot where more than one sleeping cabin exists. The applicant proposes to construct a dwelling and two sleeping cabins with increased floor areas. An exemption from section 3.45 and 4.1.61 of bylaw 2014-14 is be, being the maximum number of habitable buildings permitted on a lot Within the waterfront residential WR4 zone, a dwelling and sleeping cabin are permitted and one dwelling and three sleeping cabins are being proposed. An exemption is also requested from section 11.70 of bylaw 2014 as, 14 as amended, being the de zoning definition for height. Height is specific, as it specifically relates to the subject land is proposed to be defined as follows. When a use in reference to a building or a structure, the vertical distance between the lowest finished ground surface at the exterior of the building and directly below the highest point of the roof, or in the case of a boathouse or a sun shelter, the vertical distance between the top of the dock and the highest point of the roof, or in the case of a sun deck, the vertical distance between the lowest finished ground surface adjacent to the perimeter of the sun deck. In the case where a sun deck is joined to a building or another structure, the height of the sun deck and the height of the building or structure shall be measured separately. An exemption is also requested from section 4.1.7 and 4.1.710 of bylaw 2014-14 as amended, being the minimum lot frontage requirement of 300 feet to construct a two-story boathouse on a category one lake, Lake Rosso. The subject property has 263 feet of lot frontage, this exemption will permit a two-story boathouse to be constructed on the property in accordance with the provisions of a two-story boathouse on a lot with 300 feet of frontage. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 21 days in advance and eight submissions have been received to date. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, Eric Campbell, the Township's Interim Fire Protection Officer, and the District Municipality of Muskoka. A letter of support has been submitted by Shelley Lancaster, a neighboring property owner to the west. A letter of support has been submitted by Joanna and Scott Barker, neighboring property owners to the east. A letter of objection has been submitted by Paul and Christine Elliott, area property owners. And a letter of objection has been submitted by Rob and Teresa Scullin, area property owners. All submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. I have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of zoning bylaw amendment ZBA-64-21 bylaw 2021-199, staff recommend the following. 
One, that exemption A to permit the expansion of a sleeping cabin and dwelling where more than one sleeping cabin exists be removed from bylaw 2021-199. Two, that exemption B to permit three sleeping cabins be denied. Three, that exemption C to amend the definition of height be further amended by adding a reference to the view from Lake Rosso and approved. And four, that schedule two to bylaw 2021-199 be amended to reflect an updated site plan with revisions, including a label indicating that the building labeled as sleeping cabin number four as to be removed. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Okay. Um... Elizabeth, I think um, I'm not sure who the agent is. I know the company, but is whether Ms. Um, Poirier is here or uh, Ms. Markham. And I believe Mr. Longo is also here. Good morning, Ms. Poirier, how are you? Good morning, Chair Bridgman. I'm well, thank you. And I hope everyone there is well. So um, please, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff, all the planning staff uh, for their efforts in reviewing and analyzing our application. I submitted the application and authored a planning justification report to redevelop this property and clean up what are, in my opinion, legal non-complying structures and legal non-complying situations and put forth a plan that improves the property in several ways. We appreciate and agree with staff that a two-story boathouse as located and shown on the sketch that accompanied our application represents good planning and will not have any negative impacts. However, we maintain that all of the remaining components of the redevelopment plan and the application also represent good planning and would result in a net improvement to the property and municipality in terms of conforming with the official plan, the provincial policy statement, and the zoning bylaw with no negative impacts. As you know, this matter has been appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal and is before the tribunal now. Mr. Leo Longo, solicitor for my client, is here today and he'll speak to this matter as it relates to council making a decision on this matter and providing instructions to your solicitor. I'm here at this time primarily to answer any questions respecting our application. Otherwise, I would turn this over to Mr. Longo. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Longo. Thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman and uh, committee members. Uh, Leo Longo, Erden Burles, representing the uh, applicant in this matter. Uh, as Ms. Poirier indicated, uh, this is a matter that uh, is presently at the OLT. And I'll start my submission by um, suggesting where I would ask council to uh, end up on this matter. Uh, I would ask that uh, council receive uh, the staff report from today, receive the deputations that you received today, uh, but that um, you use your closed session meeting uh, to, which is the appropriate time to uh, provide uh, your instructions to your legal counsel respecting the OLT matter. Um, as uh, Ms. Walker uh, uh, has indicated, uh, staff has written a report that uh, does see favor with uh, many aspects of the application, uh, including the requested relief uh, or uh, on height and the uh, request for uh, citing a two-story boathouse uh, as set out in the appendix uh, to the bylaw. Um, staff have been on the site. They understand the topography of the site and the vegetation of the site and have concluded that the cottage uh, proposed and the uh, boathouse proposed are appropriate and will not have any impact. I'm pleased to see that both abutting property owners have provided their full support to this application. And I think that uh, is indicative of the care with which uh, this uh, proposal 
uh, has been uh, given in, in laying out uh, what is uh, sought. Quite frankly, the, the sole remaining issue that appears between the application as filed and appeal to the tribunal and what staff have recommended in their report are two uh, sleeping cabins and uh, the desire of the client uh, to have those. And as Ms. Poirier indicated, a removal of, I think her staff report speaks to five or six other uh, uh, accessory buildings that would be cleaned up and, and replaced as proposed by my client. Um, my experience tells me, Madam Chair and committee members, that this is a matter that hopefully can be resolved in a non-adversarial way uh, at the OLT. And I think I'd um, like the opportunity, once you've provided your instructions to your lawyer, uh, to deal uh, with um, him or her and see if this matter uh, can be uh, resolved in a, in a mutually satisfactory manner uh, without uh, necessitating a contested uh, tribunal hearing. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd be pleased to answer any questions, but I would ask that simply these reports and these deputations be received and that you provide your instructions to counsel at the appropriate time. As this is at the OLT, uh, technically the disposition of the matter is now with them and, and not with committee, but committee and counsel can certainly provide uh, their instructions to staff moving forward. And that's what I encourage you to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Longo. Uh, Elizabeth, is there anyone else uh, that would like to speak on behalf of this that you can see? I don't see any hands up. Oh, actually we do have one. Okay. I think this is going to be opposition. So, but that's the only one that we have, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I believe Mr. Elliott is coming in. Mr. Elliott, can you hear me? Uh, it's Christine Elliott, but oh, actually okay. we're, we're both here. <laughs> hey, there you are, both of you. Welcome. Thank um, you. Yeah, please, uh, your name and uh, name and address, and then you have five minutes to speak. Uh, my name is Christine Elliott and Paul Elliott, and we have the we own the property at 1731 Brackenrig Road, which is about 90 feet away from the property in question. Um, we submitted a letter of objection. Um, while we, and, and I don't want to review that letter because um, I think you've all seen it, but since reading the staff report and reading the report submitted by the homeowners, um, I just had a couple of more thoughts that I'd like to comment on. Uh, we purchased our property in 2020. Um, we looked extensively for about a year and a half on a number of lakes and we uh, specifically were interested in this property knowing that with the current bylaws, the property immediately adjacent to us, which is the Barkers, and the property in question would not be it, neither one would be able to build a two-story boathouse given the current existing bylaws. That was our understanding at the time. I also anecdotally had been told that the bylaws in Muskoka Lakes are quite vigorously um, enforced and respected. Um, that, that was certainly part of our thought process when we purchased that property. Um, I understand from looking at the submission, um, there was a lot of comment about what the property with the boathouse will look like from the viewpoint of the lake, and that there's quite a bit of space on either side of it um, from existing boathouses. But I would like to point out that the property, uh, the 90 foot frontage property owned by the Barkers that is between our property and the um, property in question. There is currently no boathouse on that property, but my understanding is that a boathouse could be built, um, which would mean if that happens that there would essentially be three boathouses in um, an area of less than 200 feet, which in my, in my view is, is quite dense for that particular area of the lake. My other thought is the boathouse in question is being built on a small point of land on the existing property or existing property. Um, 
which means, you know, for practically it can go 66 feet out, I believe, from the point of land, but from the general shoreline um, of my property, the property in between, the property on the other side, uh, it's going to protrude out more than 66 feet from most of the shoreline. Um, and, you know, at 25 feet high and, um, you know, 50 feet out or whatever the boathouse will be, it certainly will impede our westerly view. And it wasn't, it just wasn't something that we anticipated. Uh, a couple of months ago, I received the town, a survey about the town planning, and I was um, quite impressed with the questions that were asked, that it seems that the, the town is concerned about controlling the density in the area and the building in the area, particularly on the waterfront. Um, I went through the questions and answered them and certainly was uh, encouraged by what I saw in the questions. And it seems like the, the town is very interested in controlling the density in the building on the waterfront, which is, is very important to us. Um, I don't really have any other comments uh, other than to say, you know, where I'm not at this meeting because I object to improvements to the property. I certainly do appreciate that removal of the, I think several, I think illegally derelict buildings on the property would certainly be an improvement, um, but I'm not sure that um, uh, getting an exception to the bylaw with regards to a two-story boathouse or a additional probably nicer looking buildings on the property is necessarily a, a, a solution or trade-off to, you know, removing the properties that, pro the, the buildings and structures that probably never should have been there in the first place. And that's my only comment. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Helia. All right. I think that's all of our comments. So, Ms. Poirier, you certainly have the ability to respond to that if you would like to before I turn it over to committee. Uh, certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the boathouse um, has some very specific um, design to it um, that provides mitigation uh, to allow this boathouse on the lot with the frontage. There has been a number of frontage discrepancies uh, with respect to this application. And I would just note for your consideration that the tribunal or the Ontario Municipal Board, as it was formerly known, has made a ruling on several occasions that your view is limited to your view straight off from your property, um, not side views. And it's always been my understanding that the township of Muskoka Lakes, as well as all the townships in, in Muskoka, are extremely concerned about the view from the canoe, the view from the water. So respectfully, um, you know, I understand the neighbors are concerned about their side view, but uh, I think in Muskoka, it'd be very hard pressed to look sideways on any property and not see a boathouse. So that would be my response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to committee at this point, Councillor Zavitz. Well, thank you, and, and through you, <laughs> a couple things. I guess uh, I refer uh, you all to page 14 of 31 in the staff re report where we're, we're too, with good conscience, uh, support staff where, where we feel we can uh, on this committee. Um, and I see a heading under Ontario Land Tribunal Appeal. So there's two things here. First of all, Mr. Longo being in the room, I don't see our council in the room. Um, I, Mr. Longo actually referred to our council in, in terms of an open or a closed session at some point in time. Um, I am so uncomfortable with, with what this is. Um, this, I don't even think, this doesn't even make sense that we're here contemplating um, something that has already been moved to the uh, OLT and we're to make an opinion. I, I certainly won't be offering any opinion on this unless uh, our CAO or, or our director, uh, David Pink, provides me with some rationale that, uh, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, we're, we're to be guarded, we're to be, uh, you know, wide open and, and, and keep our, our, our minds clear. Um, this is a pretty muddy one and I don't understand why uh, we have legal on this call. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pink, can I ask you to uh, explain the process here in terms of the township's thought? On, on hearing this today, please. 
certainly, and uh, through you. I think uh, to start, this is not uh, the most common situation. It's probably the first time I can recall where an application has been appealed before a decision is made uh, in this fashion. Um, however, given that, I think Mr. Longo has acknowledged, I think it is appropriate to still hold a public meeting uh, to receive comments from the neighboring property owners. And ultimately, I think council will have to give instructions to the township solicitor or take a public position uh, as this may go to uh, hearing. But I think given uh, the comments received by uh, Mr. Longo and an indication, uh, obviously, that there's still uh, some issues that need to be discussed and worked out, uh, I would suggest uh, to council, I think uh, as much as I believe you are in a position, if you wish to make a decision on the application, uh, I think it may be prudent in this case. Uh, there's no particular uh, great urgency. Happy to schedule this uh, in camera at a future council meeting uh, and we can discuss uh, uh, potential next steps. Happy to also reach out uh, to the applicants uh, to uh, gain some further insight as well, if that's appropriate. So that uh, is assistance. So again, I think uh, the tribunal would expect public comments to be heard. And I think that would be beneficial as we work through this process. And that's why we scheduled the, the public meeting. Okay, so um, before I ask everybody for the thoughts on that, I'm going to let our three councillors speak here. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with the way that this opened and the presentation, the, the way that it did. Um, I don't like going to cold session. I believe that we should be as transparent as possible, that the public should see what's going on. Uh, and not discussions behind closed doors. And it's interesting because other municipalities seem to avoid closed sessions. So uh, that, it really concerns me. But um, a, a couple of things that I, I guess most importantly, I would ask staff if they could, I, I understand that it wouldn't be today, but we have, um, we have not allowed this for many, many years, like many years, as far as put, doing two story boat houses. Uh, and so I, I would like to have a, a better understanding of how many have we turned down? Because if we're changing direction, I'd like to understand that too. Or are we changing direction because um, a particular application has more strength in um, a legal team or something like that? You know, I, 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 it's just that we have consistently been turning down applications that are that are actually even um, they would have more frontage than this particular application. So I would like to have an understanding of that question going forward. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sharp, I see you've uh, lit up your screen. So please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and uh, through you uh, to Councillor uh, Nishikawa. I'm not sure that I can provide any uh, statistical analysis with respect to how many applications have been uh, applied for for two-story boathouses on less than 300 feet of frontage and how many have been approved or defeated, but I think we've laid out our analysis in quite a lot of detail in the township staff report and, you know, I think um, the considerations that we really uh, relied on um, in making our recommendation centered around the fact that the property has a straight line frontage as required to be measured by the bylaw of less than 300 feet. However, the actual or assessed frontage of the property is more uh, in line with approximately 330 feet as measured by a reputable Ontario land surveyor. And the township's official plan doesn't define how one measures lot frontage and therefore uh, with respect to policies in the official plan that require 300 feet of frontage for a two-story boathouse, one could argue that with 330 feet of assessed frontage or actual frontage, um, it, it's in conformity uh, with the official plan. Um, there's other considerations that we've included in our report. For example, uh, one of the accessory buildings um, uh, that's located on land is in proximity to the shoreline and is in view from the shoreline. And if uh, committee is making a recommendation to approve the application, staff have recommended that that building uh, be removed uh, in recognition of the fact that uh, the two-story boathouse with the sleeping cabin above is proposed over water and is, uh, the built form associated with that building is difficult to mitigate. 
um, and the removal of the land-based building would be an overall net improvement. There'd be some possibility for some plantings and we would see that as a good, um, a good thing and an overall improvement in the context of, of the property. I'm happy to elaborate further if needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Thank you. Uh, just one point of clarification on uh, page 105 of our agenda. There appears to be a survey dated November 23rd, 2020. I, the survey looks like it's labeled to me a two-story boathouse existing. Is it a two-story or a one-story? Just that the label looks to appear to say two-story. I may be wrong. Um, just want clarity that there's an existing one-story boathouse on the property. Uh, and then a second question, and I, I apologize for being a little slow here. The appeal to OLT is for no decision. Yet, this in my, I'm, maybe I missed it again. We're seeing this for the first time, so we haven't had a chance to provide a decision on this process and on this application. I, I'm not sure how we can appeal something that we haven't had a chance to opine on yet. So maybe just help me from some of the background and legal uh, issues here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Harding. I believe it was it was the time element. But Director Pink, would you like to comment on that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, in regard to the first question, it's definitely a one story. Um, the PDF may be a little bit fuzzy, but uh, it is an existing one story boat house. I believe it does say one on the survey. Uh, in regard to the second question, uh, this again is not uh, uh, again common at all. Uh, however, uh, if a decision is not made, regardless of whether it's brought to council or not, if a decision is not made within the timelines under the Planning Act, uh, applicants do have the right to appeal a lack of decision to the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, so one of the um, one of the drawbacks of, again, the, the workloads and high volumes of applications, staff's inability to bring uh, all of them to council or committee of adjustment uh, in the timelines we'd like to see under the Planning Act. Um, again, I don't think you regularly see this, uh, as obviously, if the applicant did not appeal, uh, they could have a decision today. Uh, and yet by appealing the application, uh, the tribunal has yet to acknowledge receipt of it or schedule the hearing. So it's not typically um, in applicants benefit to appeal a lack of decision, um, because as you can see, it's not any quicker to go through the tribunal. Uh, however, this applicant has chosen that uh, path. Uh, staff suggesting again that I think we can have uh, an in-camera discussion if council does not wish to uh, make their position known uh, on the application at this time. Happy to discuss those matters uh, in camera at a future meeting. Okay, Councillor Kelly. Thank you and uh, through you. Um, and uh, uh, thanks, thanks to Mayor Harding for getting some clarification on how we're here uh, listening to it for the first time, uh, knowing that it's already been appealed because that had me stumped as well. Um, I, I got to be honest with you, and I, I do agree with Councillor Nishikawa that, uh, uh, you know, taking things into close should probably probably be as, at a last resort. But under the present circumstances, I have to tell you, my, uh, I'm getting a strange feeling that, that anything we say here is something we probably need to consider with the benefit of of uh, uh, council and I, I think probably uh, Mr. Longo and maybe Mr. Pink's suggestion that we go into close and get legal advice on this is probably the right next step. And with that, I think that's all I wanna say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Edwards. I would say I would uh, agree with Councillor Kelly and that it's uh, it's unusual uh, and that, so I wouldn't say anything. I will have comments and we'll probably be in that closed session because I have some, some concerns, thank you. So uh, Councillor Jaglowitz, if you're going to support that, I my reading of our committee is that we would like to go into closed session. Um, if you have something else you'd like to comment on, please go ahead and then I'm gonna take the reading of the committee. Thank you, Chair. I merely wanted to state I will not, will not be discussing it today. Okay, so Mr. Pink, 
we can, I believe, move ahead. We have uh, we have all of committee wishing to move this to closed session. I just get a our our wonderful thumbs up for that. All right. So, uh, Madam Clerk, we're good with that. Just checking with our clerk. We're good. Okay. All right. All right, then we are going, thank you, uh, everyone. And we are going to move on then to our, our next one, which is uh, 2672072 Ontario Inc. And that will be Miss Darling. Welcome, Miss Darling. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. The next application to be heard is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 65 slash 21. Bylaw 2021-201 in the name of 2672072 Ontario um, Limited Inc. The, <clears throat> the lands are known municipally as 1053 Back at Bracken Rig Road, unit number two. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 262 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. A zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted to construct a two-story boathouse and an associated dock on a lot with 294.5 feet of frontage. An exemption is required to permit the two-story boathouse on a lot with less than 300 feet of frontage on a category one lake. <clears throat> Notice of this public hearing under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and four submissions have been received to date. Comments were received from Nick Snyder, Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, Township's Public Work Technician, Curtis Sivret, District Planner. These comments were forwarded to planning committee prior to the meeting. One comment was received after comments were submitted to the committee, and that was from Eric Campbell, the township's interim fire suppression officer. He commented that this location is six minutes from the nearest fire station with a 10 minute assembly time. Under ideal conditions, the first truck would arrive on this location in 16 minutes. The fire boat upon dispatch under ideal conditions will be a minimum of 30 minutes to arrive at this location. The access to the structure we suggest meets the requirement of the Ontario Building Code section 9.10.20.3. This area has no pressurized hydrants, meaning a tanker shuttle or pumper relay operation would be required in the event of a fire. I have prepared a detailed staff uh, planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have no, no concerns with this application and have no further comments at this time. And I'd be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darling. I, I see Mr. Jackson is here as the agent. So we'll just bring him in. Oh, I think he's in. Mr. Jackson, can you hear me? Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Chairman uh, and uh, members of the committee. I, I'm here. Um, I think the report covers all of the concerns uh, we would want to convey and we're just here to answer any questions. Uh, I believe the owners are also um, in the uh, audience. So um, thank you for this. Okay, thank you. Could I just get your address, please, Mr. Oh, Jackson? sorry. Uh, uh, One Mall Drive, Perry Sound, P2A 3A9. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Elizabeth, are you seeing anybody who would like to speak on behalf of this or actually or against it? I'm not seeing any hands, Barb. Oh, I think there's a Mr. French who has who just put his hand up, Elizabeth. Mr. French, can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Could you turn your video on? Uh, yes, just a minute. I'm not sure what the problem is here. I thought I'd have it on just a minute. Okay, okay. thank you. All Good. right, welcome and just your address too and then your comments within yeah. five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my name is Bruce French. Uh, I'm located at 1007 Shenima Road, which is two properties to the east, southeast of uh, 
the applicant, Lot 34, Part 7, 8 to 9. I co-own co this property with my two sisters, so I'm speaking on behalf of the three of us. So basically, we object to the granting of an amendment to this uh, to this bylaw, uh, the existing bylaw 2014-14. Um, we don't object to a construction of a boathouse under the existing bylaw that's appropriate for that property under 300, 300 feet. I tried to look at this in a uh, objective manner and I went back to the Muskoka Lakes official planning document and the sections that I thought were relevant and the salient parts were really um, in the planning document under waterfront section 2.1, you know, where it states that there should be careful consideration of the qualities that contribute to the attraction of the waterfront and shared enjoyment of lakes and rivers. Um, section 2.4 in the principles speaks to um, limiting, you know, limiting, protecting the character of the waterfront. Uh, waterfront character is defined as, you know, height, build size, build form, et cetera. Um, section 3.1 under goals is, is, speaks to protecting the character of the waterfront. Section four under objections, uh, objectives, uh, is to ensure that the built form does not become concentrated or dominate the waterfront to the detriment of the natural form. Uh, section 4.14 um, is to ensure development in the areas uh, does not result in following situations, including detracting from the natural landscape. And section 4.18 uh, is that the development does, does not dominate the natural shoreline. So the waterfront character in the vicinity of this property is that uh, to the northwest there's an adjacent property which has a single story boathouse. To the southeast there's an adjacent property to the applicant's property is a single story boathouse. Uh, both of these are shown on page three and four of the report that was submitted to the committee. Um, and then following as you go to the northeast is our property, which is a dock with no boathouse, with no plans to build one. Uh, going further, further east, there's another dock followed by another property with a single story boathouse. Uh, so if you look at the key map that was provided, the applicant's property is on sort of a little bay. And if you measure the uh, angle of that property versus the southern shoreline of Arthurly Bay, there's roughly 110 degree uh, degrees of arc that property to the uh, southern shoreline. So I would I look at it and say this application does not appear to be consistent with the official plan principles goals or the objectives. Um, I do note in the staff report that was submitted they recommend approval of this amendment. Uh, however, this report is looking in the context, context of the entire built structure of the three lakes. And I have you refer to page six of 12, where it states the three lakes, Muskoka, Rosso, and Joseph, generally exhibit larger built forms and building types than the smaller lakes. So clearly the context of that report is, is the entire built structure of the lakes. It really doesn't look at the context of this portion, that southern shoreline of Arthurly Bay, which is the bay on uh, Lake Rosso where this applicant is uh, is located. So I would look at and ask you, know, has there been careful consideration of the qualities and in particular, the aesthetic qualities of the proposal as contemplated in section 2.2, which of course, if the amendment is granted, would result in a uh, fairly large two-story boathouse, which is really amidst um, you know, one-story boat houses or docks with no boat houses. It appears to me um, that it would detract from the shared enjoyment of the lake as contemplated in section 2.2 of the planning document. Um, this application, I think, is inconsistent with the character of the waterfront area in this area, which is contemplated in section 2.4 and the goals 3.1. Uh, objective 4.2 in the planning document uh, has an objective ensuring the built form does not dominate the waterfront to the de de detriment of the natural form. Uh, and I would say this building of a two-story boathouse would not be consistent 
with this objective. Um, the building of a two-story boathouse would not be consistent with section 4.18, which requires control of the development to ensure that it does not, not dominate the natural sh shoreline, nor section 4.14, which requires that development does not detract from the natural landscape. So really Thanks, for the- Mr. Mr. French, you are at five minutes. So could I ask you to wrap it up, please? Yeah, and I'm finished, thank you. For the reasons I've gone through, uh, we object to the zoning uh, bylaw amendment and ask for your consideration. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Jackson, you have the opportunity to respond to that before I turn it over to committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd just like to indicate what the impact of this decision really, really will have on the property. And that impact is the ability to put 650 square feet of space on a boathouse, uh, which would comply with, uh, as a single story, with the rules that are in place. So we're merely short by a few feet to qualify for this additional uh, space on the, on the boathouse. Uh, so it would be my respectful of that, that domination that um, Mr. French is describing is not in fact um, true, that this is more likely uh, had the world evolved in a normal way, this would have been considered minor, uh, but it's proceeded in this, this fashion for management purposes. But I respectfully disagree and hope that you uh, support, can support this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, committee, do I, any comments? All right, seeing none, I am going to read the motion. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Mazan, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-65-21-267207 Ontario Inc. be approved. Any comments? All in favor? Madam Chair? Harry? Can we just call a post? Sorry. Oh, okay. Those opposed? That's curious. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so our next, our next application is uh, uh, Schnipper and this is Miss Walker again, I believe. There you are, Miss Walker, please take it away. Thank you, Chair Bridgerton. The next application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA 67 slash 21 bylaw 2021 206 in the name of Shipper. The subject property is known municipally as 1113 Gulf Avenue Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan, <coughs> excuse me, and drawings beginning on page 289 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. The subject land contains a two-story boathouse with a dwelling located on the upper story and an associated dock. The applicants proposed to, to demolish the existing two-story boathouse with a dwelling and the associated dock and construct a new two-story boathouse with a dwelling and an associated dock. Bylaw 2021-206 will provide exemptions from the minimum lot frontage requirement for a lot of record, the minimum lot frontage requirement for a two-story boathouse, the prohibition of a dwelling unit within the second story of a boathouse, the maximum floor area of the second story of a boathouse, the maximum permitted height for a boathouse on a lot with less than 300 feet of frontage, the maximum cumulative dock width, first story boathouse width and second story boathouse width, the minimum side yard setback of a dock, a single story boathouse with a rooftop sun deck and a two story boathouse, the minimum setback requirement from an unopened road, original road allowance, and the pro prohibition on a two-story boathouse and single-story boathouses with rooftop sun decks within the waterfront residential restricted zone. Please refer to the public notice for a full explanation and all the details of the requested exemptions. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 21 days in advance and five submissions have been received to date. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, Eric Campbell, the Township's Interim Fire Protection Officer, and the District Municipality of Muskoka. A letter of support was submitted by Heidi Henskel, the neighboring property owner to the south. 
All submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting. I have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of zoning bylaw amendment ZBA-67-21 bylaw 2021-206, staff recommend the following. That a decision on zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA-67-21 bylaw 2021-206, Shipper, be deferred to enable the applicant to uh, application to be amended to ensure that the proposed boathouse is located off the original show road allowance or off the original road allowance, pardon me, and redesign at an equivalent or reduced dimensions. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. All right, I believe Mr. Allen is here as the agent. And I believe the owners are also here. Welcome, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, good morning, committee members, members of the public and staff. My name is Ryan Allen, professional planner with Planscape 104 Kimberly Ave, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1Z8. I'm here today to assist the uh, Shipper family uh, with their proposed zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, Jane and Stuart are the owners. I have prepared a presentation to the committee. If that could be queued up, please. Next slide. As mentioned, the property is at 1113 Gulf Avenue Road, which is just northwest of Windermere on Lake Rosso. Next slide, please. Uh, the subject property is uh, long and narrow. It's located in uh, the bay that outlets um, from Three Mile Lake. Uh, you can see that there are two original road allowances that cross Lake Rosso and one abuts the subject property. I've noted the location of the existing dock and boathouse. And the distance, uh, the narrowest point of this uh, channel is 260 feet from the neighboring property. And you can see the, uh, the character of development in this area. Next slide, please. The proposal in front of you, as mentioned by uh, Ms. Walker, is to construct a new two-story boathouse and dock further from shoreline. And the intention for the relocation is to provide greater water depth. I'll expand on that uh, later in my presentation. The increased dock size is to provide greater movement and expanded sitting area. The increased second story boathouse area is to provide more convenient access to the second story and the increased height is to provide added ceiling height on the second floor. Next slide, please. This is the proposed uh, site plan that also shows the existing development. You'll see that with the exception of a small portion of the existing boathouse and dock, there is no development on land that structure that is. Uh, there is a septic system as well as a driveway and the road allowance is abutting to the west. Next slide, please. The proposed amendment in front of you uh, does consist of a lengthy list of exemptions, uh, but I would note that the existing legal non-complying dock and boathouse can be uh, reconstructed under the non-complying provisions of the bylaw one-to-one. -one. However, any relocation or movement, even by a small amount, triggers all of these uh, bylaw exemptions. So I think it's important to note specifically the bylaw differences between the existing and the proposed development, and those include the following. Uh, 10 feet of dock and boathouse length. This is not an, a physical extension, but a relocation further out into the lake. One foot of additional boathouse height, 2.7 square feet of additional second story floor area, and 155 square feet of additional dock. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an enlargement of the proposed site plan. You'll see the existing dock and boathouse are outlined in red. I know there's a lot of uh, overlays going on here, but you can see that the uh, the gray is the proposed and the location is simply slid out from the shoreline at the existing location by 10 feet. The proposed boathouse and the existing boathouse will be the same size, no change in dock or boathouse width. 460 square feet of dock and boathouse are to be removed from the shoreline. Currently, the boathouse is set back 20 feet um, onto the shoreline and the maximum is 10. That will be rectified. The new boathouse will not exceed 10 feet back onto shore. 230 square feet of boathouse and dock are to be removed from the road allowance and the dock and boathouse lengths comply with the bylaw. Next slide, please. This is an elevation of the proposed boathouse. You'll see it's very much in keeping with the, uh, the design and the, uh, the dark color will help it blend into the shoreline. Next slide, please. In terms of the changes that I mentioned, uh, you'll see a photograph of the existing dock and boathouse on the bottom. 
The 155 square feet of additional dock is intended to square off um, a triangular shape of dock. And you'll see by the photograph, it's very tight. Um, a few chairs and a canoe makes it very difficult to, um, to uh, maneuver around. Um, the intention for that additional 155 square feet is to provide a bit more space for sitting and enjoyment. Next slide, please. In terms of the second story floor increase, uh, there currently is a, an L-shaped second story. The, uh, the owners would like to include an angled uh, entryway into this portion of the building. Uh, 936.5 square feet today, uh, 939 square feet proposed. I would note that this is all of the habitable space that's currently located on the property. 939 square feet of habitable space on a lot on Lake Rosso would be uh, probably one of the smallest habitable areas on the lake. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the additional height, you'll see the existing elevation on the top at 17 and a half feet with the proposed elevation on the bottom at 18 and a half feet for the one foot height difference. You'll see that the including the structure of the roof, the, the, current, um, uh, the current building only has about seven and a half feet of headroom from the floor to the ceiling um, of the, uh, the second story. So this additional height is intended to provide a little more headspace. And you'll see that the, uh, the roof is going from a bit of a, a low slope to a flat roof design. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a photo from the lake of the existing dock and boathouse. Uh, Mr. Shipper has had an engineer involved. This boathouse was built prior to building code standards and is in need of repair or replacement. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, demonstrating the very steep slopes that exist on the property. Uh, this is uh, the back of the existing boathouse and upper sun deck. Next slide, please. Uh, you've seen this slide already. This is the side for the um, oh, this photo already. This is the uh, the side of the boathouse with the dock addition will be located. Next slide. Uh, the boathouse is currently tucked into a small embayment along the shoreline of Lake Rosso. The dotted lines indicate the approximate extension uh, where the boathouse would be located uh, if if repositioned, and any any other locations on the shoreline, particularly further to the north. Um, that is away from the road allowance uh, will force the boathouse and dock to extend further out into the lake due to the configuration of the shoreline. Next slide, please. And, and specifically relocating the boathouse, we, the intention was to take the environment first approach here and to find a, a location and development plan that was least impactful to the site using the existing development footprint was viewed to be the least impactful. Relocation of the boathouse further north would require the removal of an existing well-vegetated naturally forested buffer, which you see here in these photos. If the boathouse removed, was moved, the, this vegetation would be completely eliminated. And you'll also see a, a number of rock outcrops um, that may pose challenge for site alteration being required. Uh, next slide, please. And the real reason for pushing the boathouse farther out, you can see at the, uh, the back of the slip, there is barely enough uh, depth to dip a paddle. And at the, uh, the entrance door, the blade of the paddle barely makes its way underwater. So clearly uh, there is very limited ability to, uh, to put any boat into this boathouse. Next slide, please. In terms of the planning analysis, I mentioned that the existing dock and boathouse are permitted to be reconstructed one-to-one -one in the same location, same size, same extent. The existing dock and boathouse are need to a replacement. The current shallow water depths prohibit the use of the boathouse for berthing boats, which is the intention uh, and use for a boathouse. The existing boathouse coverage is unchanged. The dock width and boathouse widths are unchanged. The proposed dock and boathouse lengths comply. The proposed lot coverage is unchanged. The existing is 5.3, the maximum is 5.3, oh, sorry, the, the proposed is 5.3, well below the permitted maximum. Next slide, please. And in terms of the proposed location versus a new location, the uh, reutilizing the footprint of the existing dock and boathouse um, makes use of an existing disturbed and development area. Uh, no vegetation or tree removal will be required whatsoever to construct the boathouse. The boathouse and dock can be constructed entirely from the water by barge. So no tree removal will be required. By moving the boathouse further out into the water by 10 feet, it frees up 460 square feet of development from the shoreline that could be reforested and revegetated. And sliding the boathouse out in its current location allows for the existing access stairs and the septic system connection to be utilized without making um, many modifications or relocations. It's simply just a 10 foot extension to the new location of the boathouse. 
the uh, location requires uh, relocation requires um, a, you know, a much more substantial removal of, of vegetation along the shoreline as well as um, alteration of steep slopes. Um, encroachment um, on the road allowance has been reduced uh, by more than half. It's down to 230 square feet. Uh, we recognize that there still is some encroachment that exists. The dock represents a small increase, but no further increase in width or length beyond the existing. The added additional boathouse height and second story area are very small increases and have uh, no impact on the views of neighboring property owners, the character of the property, the appearance uh, built form. So well, I think it's important you know, to note the, the size of that second story would exceed the 650 square feet area that we are used to seeing. They, they presently have the ability to replace that existing one to one and the additional 2.7 square feet doesn't provide any additional bed space, living area that would significantly change the use of this, uh, this boathouse. And 939 square feet of habitable space is relatively modest on a, on a waterfront property. And, and same thing with the height, the additional height will not significantly change um, the character, appearance, or impact the views from neighboring properties. Next slide, please. It was my professional opinion that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment conforms to the district and official plans, the district and township official plans consistent with the PPS and represents good planning. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Right. Um... Elizabeth, do we see anybody who would like to speak on behalf of this application? Not seeing any. Uh, any opposed? Oh, okay. oh Mr. Allen? Uh, through you, Chair Bridgman, I believe that Mr. Stuart Shipper um, is on the call, and I believe he has prepared some comments that he would like to present to the committee. Of course. So, okay, if we could bring Mr. Shipper in, that would be great, but I... I do not see any anyone else, so we'll have him speak and then we'll turn it over to committee. Mr. Schiffer, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. There yeah. you are. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, if you could just give your uh, address. And then you're sure. uh, uh, 1113 uh, Golf Avenue Road, uh, Unit uh, 7. Thank you. Um, perhaps before I start, I would, can you possibly bring up uh, slide 15 of the Planscape presentation while I speak? I think we could probably do that. Just give us a Thank second. You. Great, thanks very much. Um, thanks for reviewing our application and giving me this opportunity. Uh, Ryan's described the uh, modifications that we're asking for and I'm hoping to provide some context for it. Uh, for 20 years, my family cottage has been in a, a 1100 square foot Viceroy next door to the subject property. A few years after, a few years later, when it became available for sale, we were able to buy the subject property, which as has been mentioned, has a legally non-conforming boathouse as the only building on a very steeply sloped property. Uh, my family's lucky to be on one of the very secluded bays on one of the big lakes. We adore it for a number of reasons and including its natural setting. If you uh, were to, if you noticed on the aerial view in Ryan's presentation, you noticed you can't see anything on our properties except trees, and that's intentional. Uh, my wife is passionate about water quality on the lake and has done volunteer water testing for MLA for 10 years. We're members of Safe, uh, Safe Quiet Lakes. We uh, sail and paddle regularly. Uh, at the risk of sounding our own horn, I feel that the way that our property has been developed and the way that we use it exemplifies the best of Muskoka the opposite of uh, mega cottages, except ex excessive site clearing and cigarette boats. Uh, unfortunately, the boathouse structure has deteriorated, deteriorated beyond repair and my family's faced with the choice of rebuilding it or seeking approval to build a cottage on land with required setbacks. Our, our clear preference is to rebuild the boathouse. 
As Ryan mentioned, because it's legally non-conforming, we'd be permitted to do so using the same uh, footprint and envelope without requiring planning approval. However, the existing building uh, was built to a very low standard in some important ways. Uh, the water depth isn't adequate to bring a boat into the slip, so we've asked to pull the building away from the shore by 10 feet, which as noted still complies with the bylaw and I would, I would argue, based on my years in the Bay, doesn't interfere with boat traffic in the Bay. I know that was a concern of Councillor Edwards. Uh, the ceiling height inside the living area is only seven and a half feet, so we've asked to increase the building height by a foot to allow a more reasonable ceiling height. There's no table land on the steeply sloped site uh, and only a minimal amount of dock space, as you've seen, to use to spend time outdoors. So we've asked to add 155 square feet by partially filling in the L shape without adding dock length or width. Um, if we can make these modest modifications to bring a new boathouse to a level that makes sense for a growing family, then we would move forward with it. If we can't, uh, if it can't be brought up to a level, then we'd have to look more seriously at alternatives on land. I want to emphasize that our proposed modifications don't alter the scale or character of the building in any way. Uh, I've met with, uh, we have very few neighbors on the bay, as you can see from the photo in front of you. I've met with uh, the three of them closest to the property. All three have submitted letters. Unfortunately, only one of them was submitted in time uh, for the record, but I can assure you that there are two other letters. Uh, when, I, when I look, and then uh, on, as to the modifications, the last point I would make is that when I look at the scale of development around Muskoka uh, and think of what we're asking for and being denied here, I, I, I do find the disconnect striking. With regard to the encroachment, it's existed since the building was built around 1960, and it only became known to the township when we self-reported it at the time that we bought the property. Uh, as a result, we entered into a license agreement at that time for which we carry the appropriate insurance and pay the township an annual fee. It's important to note that the road allowance runs down a hill in places as a cliff and as a result is not usable as a road. We don't believe we're encroaching on land with any past, current or future use to the township. Everyone here is concerned with Muskoka's environmental sustainability. The existing boathouse is partially over land and partially over water. By rebuilding it in the current location, we avoid disturbing the lake bed in a new location and we avoid the tree removal required for a new location. And by rebuilding the boathouse instead of a building, instead of building a cottage on land, we eliminate the vastly more extensive impact of required tree removal. And given the steepness of the site, the required site work to make way for construction of a cottage. Lastly, uh, the current location is, re is in a recessed pocket along the shoreline, which makes it naturally the best location on the frontage, as is evident from the picture in front of you. Uh, eliminating the encroachment will require that the boat has to be moved out of the recess and along the shore further out into a nar narrowing bay uh, to the detriment of the neighboring property, my family cottage. It will make it, could make it, uh, considerably less sense for us to rebuild if the new boathouse location overly imposes on our enjoyment of the use of our cottage dock. As a result of the current boathouse structure reaching the end of its life, we have choices to make. Our preference is to build a small, humble, all wood structure in the location that has the least impact environmentally and visually on the site and on the area. To do this requires some approvals here. The existing building has encroached for 60 years without harm or consequence to the township. Rebuilding it in the current location is clearly the lowest impact and most reasonable solution given all the factors. If you have discretion in allowing us to continue the encroachment, please give your consideration to using that discretion here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Mr. Schiffer. Okay, uh, no other comments from the public, so I am going to turn it over to committee. Committee, any comments, questions? Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the property uh, to the south, obviously, is our road allowance. Um, 
the shippers, you own the property adjacent to the north? That's correct. Okay. So I guess to the perspective of staff, the relocation um, of the boathouse moving a little bit closer to your also northern property. Um, I know we want to try and maximize to the south, but uh, what would an objection be to moving the boathouse further north? All right, is that that's to staff? Yes, okay. I, I think it's actually probably to uh, Mr. Shipper in particular, um, okay. because uh, you know he, he is the adjacent neighbor. Is there an ability? Uh, you know, I understand where it is. If he was not the neighbor to the north, then you know obviously you're infringing on the neighbor's property, but it is your own property. So I'd just like to know why we couldn't potentially move the boathouse a little further north. Well, Mr. from my perspective, um, right now I have right now the our family cottage has a dock which we use. Uh, primarily for when we're using the waterfront. Uh, the boathouse uh, is there as a, uh, as a place to, you know, house family, but the, the dock is, the, the cottage dock is our principal waterfront area and will continue to be our principal waterfront area. And uh, if the relocation of the boathouse is going to mean that it's both closer to us and further in our face, as it were, because it moves out of the recess, then I'm not going to cut my nose off to spite my face. And it may, you know, it would be, uh, you know, um, unfortunate for us. And if what we're looking for is living space, uh, not, we're looking for living space, not a, not a boathouse principally. And so if there were a, a solution that made more sense for that property than having a boathouse stuck in front of my dog, I'd have to look at that. I hope, uh, does that make it clear? Just uh, it makes it clear on, on a perspective and uh, I appreciate that perspective. Um, and everybody obviously wants to maximize lots and views and everything else. Um, you know, obviously you're objecting to your own proposal, which is interesting <laughs> because, you know, if you were the neighbor to the North, you would say, moving it and relocating towards the center of the property so you're in compliance is going to block my view so you're kind of creating an argument that we might share anyway i'll leave my comments there uh councillor hayes thank you and through you and although that we we don't use the um the concession now by building a brand new boathouse and condoning it we are hobbling ourselves to allow this boathouse to stay for a number of years because the new construction will last a number of years. So I think that the idea of moving the boathouse off of the um, township property is a wise idea at this point because it will give us options in the future. So I support, I, I believe that the, the boathouse being reconstructed somewhere else on your property um, I would not object to that. But being it, having it reconstructed on township property, I, I can't agree with. I think that fact that it's ready to come down um, and it needs to be reconstructed, now is the time to move it off of township property and get rid of the encroachment. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, Yes, I have a tendency to um, uh, agree with Councillor Hayes uh, on, on this one, but um, I had talked to uh, and Matt Stewart and that uh, a few days ago when I had said you should ask for a uh, deferral, I would still support that. Um, if you look on page 306 of our, um, our thing, uh, the, the point of land across the road, uh, 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 across that bay that comes out, it almost comes right across there. I've taken uh, uh, my uh, boys in there fishing years and years ago. You almost have to hug that shore where that boathouse is. So going out any in, in, more uh, in that, although it's not a, a, a well-used channel, it's still a channel that, that, that can be used. Um, and that, so uh, I could agree with uh, a yeah, deferral, see what public works say. Uh, it, it is almost right on our, uh, our, our road allowance. So I would, I would like to see it move, but 
there, there may be some agreement that, that uh, could be worked out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Is this appropriate time to ask a question of staff or are we questioning the delegate? Yeah, no, no, please go ahead. Okay, so question for staff. Um, if this were to be uh, approved, is there any re anything that would prevent at a later date an application to build a cottage on the on the land? Um, it, just curious as to because this is being sort of billed as the cottage and boat house combined. Just wondered if uh, anything prevents that, or this owner or a subsequent one could come back and then build on the land also. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, and good morning, Mr. Allen and Mr. Uh, Shipper. Um, and thank you, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz for your question. I would uh, indicate that um, the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw would limit the property to one sleeping cabin and one dwelling. So if the dwelling were to remain in the boathouse, um, uh, another dwelling wouldn't uh, be permitted on the property. And with respect to uh, the existing license agreement, perhaps um, now would be an appropriate time just to address um, uh, our interpretation of the agreement itself. Um, I had heard that uh, there's legal non-complying rights associated with the existing dock and boathouse that would allow it to be rebuilt one for one. I don't believe that that would be the case uh, because part of the existing dock and the boathouse are on um, the township's road allowance on public property that aren't in the ownership of the applicant. Um, and I think the agreement allows um, the existing encroachments to be maintained, but in my reading of the agreement, there's nothing stated in it that would allow um, the encroachments to be reconstructed. And there's wording in the agreement that requires the encroachments to be removed uh, at the expiry of the agreement in December, 2028. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo the comments of Councillor Hayes and Edwards that, um, you know, I think staff's recommendation here is actually not a denial, but in fact a deferment to allow for some further dialogue to understand how to, to um, get to an, a good outcome. And part of the process when we're redeveloping, uh, particularly when things are out of conformity, is to work with staff and find ways to bring things closer to conformity. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a, a big opportunity on this particular lot. Um, so, you know, my, my suggestion to this applicant would be take staff's offer, offer of working with them and take the opportunity for a deferral and see how a better uh, improvement to this overall situation uh, could be uh, contemplated. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. Uh, to continue on those comments, again, when I first looked at this application, uh, I was more in favor of leaving it on the uh, road allowance in the fact that it would protect the neighbor to the north uh, and not have any negative impacts on them. The fact that they are the neighbor to the north uh, and trying to create a compound, so to speak, out of a couple of lots, uh, I'm less uh, inclined to protect that neighbor. So I'm, I'm looking to say, let's find a way to move this building a little bit further north uh, and it will have obviously an impact on yourself and that's your decision as to how you wanna impact yourself or not. Um, I'd also look to uh, going forward um, because we're granting some uh, oversized boathouse on small lots and everything. Um, what I would consider is restricting on land development um, and maybe capping and just keeping it as a boathouse lot uh, in itself and, and not allowing a cottage or an additional bunkie or a garage so that we uh, maintain as much natural form on the shore as possible going forward. So that'd be my su suggestion as a, a deferral, uh, which is staff's recommendation. I'd appreciate that. Wouldn't want to vote on it today. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, yes, I'm, um, uh, I see a deferral would be best for all parties. And so that, that's all I'll say. Uh, I, I'm supportive of what I've heard before. Okay, so I also would like a deferral. I, I would like to see this moved, but I would allow the little bit of extra 
in terms of the um, of the structure, the extra feet in the in the boathouse and also on the dock. So that would be my my thoughts on that. So, um, but uh, for in terms of a deferral, can I get a thumbs up from? Yeah, um, Madam Chair. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Sheffer, you're really not oh. supposed to be part of this, but let's hear what you have to say on that. Sorry, it may I, help I, us. I was going to ask for a clarification, but I can do it after you do your your thing. Well, I think we have agreed that we are going to defer, but I see Mr. Sharp also has his hands up and hand up, and and so we'll see what he has to say. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. I just wanted to clarify, it's always useful for us to, to know exactly what we're, we're being asked to do. So is it uh, you're deferring as per staff's recommendation and that's what we'll carry forward with uh, as per discussions following this meeting? Uh, yes, I'm getting a, a uh, shaking a yes. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. Okay, so that's the direction we're going to give to staff. And then yes, Mr. Sh uh, Schiffer, if you would like to make a comment, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I think I wanted to try and clarify, um, the, the chairman was the only one that addressed the bit, what I'll call the modifications as distinct from the encroachment. And she was, I think she expressed a willingness to uh, con consider accepting those modifications. Uh, would it, be, it, would, it could be helpful for us to get clarification from others as to their view of the modifications. Okay, I'm going to let Mr. Allen step in here for a second too, and then you, Councilor Mazan. Thank you, through you, Chair Bridgman. That was going to be my exact comment. Uh, you mentioned that you are supportive of, of some of these adjustments from the existing. It would be helpful when entering further discussions with staff what uh, the position of council is to help guide those discussions. Okay, well, I will find that out. Uh, they are they are modest in, in amount, so. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you. Um, interesting to use the term modest. Uh, I think the permitted size of um, accessory or a use 650 square feet um, and a minimum dwelling on the mainland would be 750 square feet. So we don't actually permit dwellings anymore on the water side. And I recognize that in this particular case, the, the land is not necessarily, um, and, the, and the mayor alluded to that, that perhaps there's a mechanism in here to try and protect from further development on the land. But if this was starting from scratch and we were permitting anything um, on the water side, it would be 650 square feet and no dwelling. So in this particular case now, um, I would suggest that the size of the uh, habitable space should be contemplated um, if it was being built on the property at the minimum it's 750 square feet and if if that's if i if my understanding of that is incorrect i'd love staff to clarify that for me um but i do feel like this is um, a fairly large livable space on a very small footprint of land and, it, and i recognize that it's been there historically um, but again I, I go back to when we are going through these redevelopment processes it's intended to try and bring things into further compliance uh, to where our, our um, zoning bylaws are today. Thank you. So I need a little clarification on that, Councillor Mazan. What you are, well, what you are saying is, if this was on land, it would have to be at least seven hundred and fifty square feet. That is my understanding. Is if you are creating a dwelling right. on mainly seven hundred and fifty square feet. Okay. So, and how is that relative to? this. I, so, I'm just trying to understand. No, no, I understand what you're, I, I, well, I'm going to try to respond, I think. It's currently at 939 square feet of livable, habitable space on a very small footprint. So my suggestion is, um, if it's not 650 square feet, that potentially 750 square feet, which would be what would happen on the mainland if you were redeveloping a dwelling today. Okay, I think I understand, but the, the overall coverage is far below the 10%. Uh, I think that's, I think that's mm -hmm. relevant, but I just throw that out as a comment. So, yeah. um, and Mr. Schiffer, uh, Schiffer, we do not 
it's this isn't really a back and forth. So at this point, I am in committee only. Anybody ask you questions, you're more than welcome to answer them. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, yes, my position is that if this was moved off the road allowance, even with a zero setback, um, I would then also want to see, as I as I started to allude to, a restriction on, on uh, no further uh, building on the land, and then I would uh, I would uh, be okay with the size because in reality it is a bunky and dwelling combined. Actually, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. I just wanted to clarify uh, staff's recommendation because uh, just hearing this, uh, Councillor Mazan, it does seem that there is a bit of a confusion about what we're recommending. So I would, I would just note that the um, the existing boathouse upper story is about 936 square feet, whereas the proposed upper story is about 939 square feet. Um, we would consider that size to be legal non-complying. So. I think what we're recommending is, is that the dock and the boathouse be shifted over to be located in front of Mr. Shipper's uh, property and that it uh, maintain um, the dimensions of the upper level and that the dock not be made any bigger. I think that's what we're, we're getting at. Um, there'll be some added uh, exemptions that may need to be um, included just given uh, the relief from uh, the common lot line between uh, the two shipper properties, but that can all be addressed as uh, minor amendments. So again, I just wanted to clarify that point. Thank you. And, and certainly we could bring forward um, um, restrictions on land-based buildings and structures uh, when it come, when it, when it, when it uh, returns to planning committee. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sharp. So I think what I'm hearing is that you are not, you're not, you don't want that extra 2.7 square feet in the, boathouse and you don't want the extra dock space. You're not, that's what I, pretty I think, sure I yeah, heard, but I think, I think we the, need to, sorry. Yeah, sorry, given the context of the property, the size, the frontage, what's there today, I think it's it's more than a reasonable recommendation in the context of uh, official plan policies. Okay, that, that, that is clear for me now, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Well, thank you and through you. Um, I would support the modest changes in increase to the boathouse and the dock, uh, provided that it is moved off of our property and that we could put uh, something to restrict further development on land. So that's what I would support. Okay, so I'm going to put that generally out. Councillor Edwards, if you have something else you want to contribute, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I basically um, agree it should be moved off of the uh, township uh, and, and that road allowance. Uh, I could go for uh, zero uh, feet or, or uh, one foot, something like that. The, the little upstairs where the was a 2.7 square feet, I could uh, for the doorway, I could allow and everything else like that. But I think it should be moved off the township property, knowing that they own the other and, and restrictions on uh, further building. Thank you. Okay, something new, Councillor Mazam. Uh, uh, thank you, and through you, it's not new, but I wanted to thank staff for the clarification because I was uh, had a misunderstanding on this. So thank you for the clarification, and I would support, uh, I guess, what just Councillor Edwards was just saying. That is, and if there's the further restrictions on the land, then that uh, I would support as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mayor Harding, and then I'm going to uh, sort of wrap this up. Sure, thank you, and I'm just wondering whether or not if uh, the applicant and uh, his agent would agree to these terms today that the uh, building does move, we could potentially move this forward and ratify it at council and not have to defer it to come back to discuss. Uh, I, I leave it in the applicant's case, but I think uh, generally I'm getting a sense that everyone's okay with all the permitted exemptions, assuming and a zero foot setback to our road allowance, uh, and then maybe some modifications, some uh, restrictions on land. But again, those can be dealt with through minor amendments when they come back to uh, council in a month and we can continue to move this thing forward. So I just put that out there. Good point. Uh, Mr. Mr. Allen, Mr. Shipper, would you be willing to do that? 
Thank you. Through you, Chair Bridgman, I think given the fact that there's a sizable um, relocation required, well, it may appear a, a slight shift off the road allowance based on my measurements. It's over a 40 foot um, relocation. And I don't believe that the water depths and you know any obstacles that are in the uh, in the lake have been well understood. So I think you know to take the cautious approach would be um, a deferral of the application to allow us to uh, revise the site plan uh, thoughtfully and then come back with a um, with a revision for consideration. Well, no problem. We were just trying to help you keep the process going if that was the case. So let's let's do the deferral. Everybody's in agreement with the deferral. I believe staff, uh, Mr. Sharp, you understand that we're okay with the modifications. We just need, okay, you, you got it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so our next, our next application is uh, Skeleton Lake Marina and Mr. Soya, I believe you're up. Madam Chair? Would you, yes, would you prefer to have lunch right now, Mr. Roberts? If I could, yes, it's <laughs> noon hour and I, I think Scotland Lake's gonna take more than a few minutes. I knew that's what you were gonna say. So, okay. Go it is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, it's 10 to 12. So let's take our hours break for lunch now then and I'll see everybody back here at 10 to one. Um, thanks, Mr. Sawyer, you'll be, you'll be back after.
Okay, if we could get everybody back, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure that Councillor Zavitz and Councillor Nishikawa will be back in a second. So, Mr. Soya, let's let's reintroduce you. There you are, and uh, Skeleton Lake Marina Limited. Please take it away. Great. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, the next application to be heard is ZBA sixty-eight. 21 in the name of Skeleton Lake Marina Limited. The subject lands consist of two abutting properties, both owned by the applicant. The northerly property has frontage on Skeleton Lake Road 3, is vacant and does not have a municipal address assigned. The southerly property is the property from which Skeleton Lake Marina operates and is known municipally as 1008 Skeleton Lake Road 3. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan starting on page 357 of the agenda package. Uh, this proposal involves an expansion of the marina's existing docking and parking facilities. The purpose and effect of the application is to rezone the northerly lot from the rural residential RUR zone to the waterfront commercial marina WC2 zone and to then restrict the permitted uses on this northerly lot to only permit a parking area in a defined location. On the southerly lot, the proposal involves a dock addition, which would increase the length of an existing dock. In the waterfront commercial marina zone, a dock length of 80 feet is permitted. The existing dock that is to be enlarged has an existing length of 160 feet, and the proposal involves adding a further 80 foot extension for a total length of 240 feet. Um, I will also direct committee's attention to figure one of the staff report on page 338 of the agenda, which provides an aerial photograph of the existing docks and an approximate illustration of the proposed dock addition. A uh, notice of this public meeting was circulated 20 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act, and uh, 35 submissions have been received to date. Uh, Development Services Division and Public Works staff have advised they have no concerns with the application. Emergency Services staff have, ad have advised that uh, response time for a fire is approximately 16 minutes and that is suggested that water access be maintained for the use of portable fire pumps in the event of a fire. Uh, Curtis Sivrit, district planner, has provided comments on behalf of the district of Muskoka, and I'll read the recommendation from his letter. District staff would recommend that a decision on the above noted application be deferred pending the completion of a site evaluation by a qualified biologist, which states that the proposed parking lot will not negatively impact any natural heritage features or functions for which the heritage area was established. Uh, should council wish to consider the application, district staff would recommend that the portion of the lands containing the Beaumont Bay Carbonates uh, Muskoka Heritage Area be placed in an, in an environmental protection zone and that appropriate development control techniques pro prohibit site alteration or vegetation removal within those areas. Uh, there have been 31 submissions from members of the public. 15 of these have been submitted in support and 16 letters have been submitted in opposition. One of the letters in opposition also was submitted on behalf of nine property owners. Uh, submissions have been provided to committee in advance of today's meeting and continue to trickle in. And I'll provide a summary of comments received. Uh, the majority of the comments received in support are from owners of properties that are only accessible by water. Letters in, of, in support of the application have been received by Rich and Ann uh, Giot, uh, Bruce Gooch, um, Tom and Rita Davidson, Jane and John Grant, Paul and Sandy Wilson, Matt and Liz Kensett, and Rebecca Danson. 
uh, Jim and Jane Cruteau, Murray Dixon and Susan Cox, Charlie Packwood, Fred and Marilyn Bishop, Kenneth and Maureen Auden, Lynn uh, Vaught, Mark Kimmel and Philip Robbins, Gary Nevison, David and Susan uh, Bowlby, uh, and that, that is all the, the letters in support. Uh, the majority of letters received in opposition are from property owners in Beeman's Bay, um, the bay that the marina um, fronts onto. Uh, letters in opposition to the application have been received by Deirdre and Gil Brood, uh, Jennifer and Paul Shakespeare, Bruce and Ann Allen, Deborah Noble, Sandy and David Pettigrew, Charles and Christine Forrest, Alan Gunning, Stephen uh, Leggett, who has submitted uh, a letter on behalf of nine properties. Uh, and the owners of those are uh, Paul Briggs, Anthony and Kathy Arthur, Jonathan and Mirjam Wolf, Rob Will, uh, Stephen and Joanne Leggett, uh, Robert and Maureen Clark, Jeffrey and Glenna Pike, Susan Fleming, uh, and letters have also been submitted um, in opposition by Tom Darlington, Diane Smith, Wolf Creaser, Susan and William Urie, Paul and Lizanne uh, Kirazewick, uh, Carolyn Guppy, Peter Jarrett, and Art Inslee. In summary, the letters received in support have raised the following considerations. Uh, many have stated that there are only two marinas on Skelton Lake, and the other marina, which is Muskoka Village Harbor Marina, announced um, to the residents on the lake last year that it was closing. Although it is possible that the marina will now continue to operate, the number of docks that will be available for residents of water only access properties on Skeleton Lake is currently unknown and may be decreasing. Therefore, the addition of more docks at Skeleton Lake is noted as being uh, very positive and will provide an essential service for properties that are only accessible by water. Uh, the submissions in support have also stated that a potential reduction in boat slips on the lake, um, that with a potential reduction in boat slips on the lake, many owners of properties that are only accessible by water may be forced to take their boat in and out of the uh, water at the public boat ramp beside the marina, which uh, would be a cause of a result in additional traffic in Beeman's Bay, but that this additional traffic is not directly tied to the addition of the proposed locks, uh, proposed docks. Um, so that is um, stated in several letters. Several letters also state that if the increased demand for docking and parking is not met, usage of the public docks and ramps on the lake may increase, which could be problematic at an already very busy public launch. Uh, conversely, many of the letters in support state that 14 new boat slips could help reduce usage of the public boat launch and dock on the abutting township owned property to the south. Uh, there's also an expectation in the letters that docking for water access properties is a long-term problem uh, that would be only partly alleviated by the addition of the 14 proposed boat slips. So then the letters that were received in opposition brought forth the following concerns. Commonly stated concern is safety, uh, specifically contribute, um, attributed to the narrowness of Beeman's Bay. Um, the majority of comments stated that there's already too much traffic in this bay and additional docks will result in more traffic. Uh, and this would result in decreased safety for swimmers, kayakers, canoers, and paddleboarders, anyone using that, uh, that water body or part of it, part of that water body. And it's also been stated that regardless of these docks, um, if they're built or not. Um, if Village Harbor Marina were to close, um, or if it was to not offer, offer fuel services, traffic in the bay would be significantly increased um, as more traffic would be um, directed to Skelton Lake 
marina. Uh, increased erosion is another concern that's been raised as a result of more boat traffic, so shoreline erosion and uh, other environmental impacts from additional traffic have also been noted. Also increased visual and noise impacts resulting from more boat traffic. Sorry, just a couple more here. Just want to make sure I don't miss any main points. Um, and it, all, it has also been stated um, that uh, in several letters that um, a new marina or new parking uh, options um, should be should be made possible on Skeleton Lake. And uh, several letters stated concerns with the circulation distance of the public notice, um, uh, stating that uh, that all properties along Beeman's Bay would um, should have been circulated. And uh, staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration, um, and have recommended that the bylaw be approved subject to the property and proposed development being made subject to site plan control. While the marina property is a commercial property and the northerly lot is intended to be a commercial property, site plan control would not be triggered by the construction of the parking, of the parking lot or docks. However, the northerly most portion of the um, intended parking lot property is within a heritage area and staff had recommended that development be directed outside of the heritage area through the site plan control process. In addition, site plan, site plan control could also be useful to ensure any stormwater management concerns can be addressed. Uh, with regards to the heritage area, the district municipality of Muskoka has provided comments recommending that the application be deferred pending the completion of a site evaluation by a qualified biologist to ensure the parking lot will not uh, negatively impact the features and functions of this heritage area, or if committee wishes to consider the application that the portion of the property that is within the heritage area be placed into the environmental protection EP1 zone. It should be noted that the parking area as shown on the site plan drawing is outside of the heritage area, but is adjacent to it. Uh, to provide an indication of scale, the heritage area consists of a large area involving much of the lands between Skelton Lake to the north and Highway one, uh, 141, and also extends to the south of Highway 141. Uh, sensitivity of this site is related to a combination of geological features that support high quality forest stands and a diversity of uh, flora and woodland fauna. Only the northerly portion of the subject lands is considered within the heritage area and a residential dwelling is located within the heritage area directly to the north of this subject property. So staff would also point out that the retention of vegetation in this location will provide a useful buffer between the adjacent residential use and the proposed parking lot. So therefore, in consideration of the district's recommendation, if committee chooses to defer the application, a site evaluation could be requested as has been suggested by the district or as suggested as an alternative through a minor amendment to the draft bylaw, the entire area to the north of the proposed parking area could be rezoned to the environmental protection EP1 zone. And uh, that concludes my comments at this time, but I would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. I believe the agent is a Mr. Jones, Curtis Jones. So we'll just wait for him to come in. Mr. Jones, can you hear me? There you are. Well, are we good? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Good just afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. So just your your uh, address and um, please, uh, yep. away you uh, go. Yep, 408 Old Ferguson Road, Huntsville. Okay, please carry on. So uh, going through this, um, to be quite honest, um, the application uh, has come along just due to the pressure on the lake. 
um, with the uncertainty of what's going on at Village Harbor Marina. Uh, we were not actually looking to expand any docking or parking operations in the near future. Um, this has been brought on by uh, public demand uh, for cottage residents that are water access. Um, we're looking at it that the property is significant enough to handle it. Um, as far as the Beaumont Bay carbonate area, uh, we've done what we could to stay within the boundaries of that. Obviously, environmental and safety are uh, the utmost concerns. Um, we realize that safety in Beaumont Bay and uh, referred to as the cut, the narrow part of that, this has always been a concern. Um, it's been any uh, AGM I've been at with the uh, Skeleton Lake Cars organization. It's always been a, uh, a very vocal point with everybody present at those meetings. Um, it is an issue, uh, absolutely not gonna deny that. However, uh, the standpoint that I'm looking at with the uncertainty of what's going on at the other marina, if fuel operations cease there, um, ice cream, as simple as it is, the traffic will be coming towards us one way or the other. Um, so as far as saying 14 slips are going to significantly impact that, depending on the operations at VHM, Village Harbor Marine, um, they're gonna dictate which way that goes, whether it's the public landing or towards Skeleton Lake Marina. Uh, we definitely wanna work with our neighbors, friends, boaters, uh, committee, council, uh, and work through this. And we wanna do it as responsibly and as sustainably as we possibly can. And I appreciate your time and looking into this. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Elizabeth, do we have, see anybody who would like to speak for this application? I don't see any hands. Okay, anyone in opposition to this application? Not seeing any. Okay, all right. Well, in view of that, Mr. Mr. Jones, if I could just ask you one question. Um, Safe Quiet Lakes has a no wake zone projects that they do. I just wonder if your marina has approached them yet for the end of that bay. So uh, we haven't approached them. Um, I've been, had discussions with, uh, you know, <laughs> Pat, plowing snow at the marina at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, people stopping by knowing what was going on. And I've expressed uh, the same concerns that they do um, myself and our staff, we spend more time on the lake <clears throat> and through that cut than many. And I openly am open having the nine kilometer an hour zone uh, restricting towable water sports. Um, I know a lot of people won't like that end of it. Um, as far as a no wake zone, um, if it was going to impact anybody the most, it would be us and our staff as it would limit uh, how much we can actually do in a day with regards to water testing. So I think us opening up to that uh, absolutely. I'd love to have a conversation with Safe Quiet Lakes, uh, the Skeleton Lake Cars organization. Um, we are completely open and to supporting a no wake zone. And I'll be honest with you, the towable water sports in that area. Um, I witnessed an accident three years ago and uh, it's uh, the, the bay is congested uh, with that. So I know I might be shooting myself in the foot here a little bit with us trying to go with an expansion, but uh, you know, Myself, uh, my staff, and our neighbors and friends, we all have responsibility to get home to our families at night. Um, so doing this safely, no wake zone, anything that limits this to make it as safe as possible, we are on board 110%. Okay, I just thought I'd mention that in the, in the beginning. So committee, yep. do we, I'm gonna turn it over to committee now. Committee, any questions, any comments? Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and through you, um, I'm uh, very uh, supportive of doing the, the, any all the concern letters of concern that came across had safety as their as as I think their main theme, and I'm wondering um, uh, you you didn't, Madam Chair, bring up about the safe and quiet lakes. Is there anything that the township can do to promote? Um, the posting of signage. I know this this is a federal area, but what can we do to uh, to get those signs posted? Because uh, uh, it's obvious that there is a problem here, and but it's also obvious that we that the lake requires the this uh, this service. So I guess that's the question. Maybe to staff, what can the township do to help facilitate? Um, uh, speed limits on that lake, on that area, in that area. 
All right, so I'm going to ask either Mr. Pink or Mr. Sharp. I know it isn't technically our part, but is there, can we be encouraging in some ways that make a difference, Mr. Pink? Thank you, uh, committee, uh, through you, Chair uh, Bridgman. Uh, I believe the uh, speed limits are under the control of Transport Canada. Uh, the best municipality can do is make an application. Uh, from what I've heard in the past in my involvement, it's not a lengthy or not a brief uh, or relatively easy exercise. Uh, if council directs, uh, staff can certainly pursue that. I would have to speak with the other associations as to other types of signage that uh, may be able to be put up. Uh, but I know to formally change the speed limit on that bay, uh, that would have to be an application through Transport Canada. Thank you. And I, I know how difficult that is. They usually want a coalition from right across the country before they'll even look at anybody. Uh, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm actually very much in support of this application. We do need uh, certainly expansion. Um, yes, there's a few people in the narrow channel coming into it that will be affected, but I think working with them, uh, even in front of those people, a slow down, no wake, uh, voluntary marker uh, certainly helps guide people and change their behavior. And certainly anytime a uh, patron from the lake was to come into the marina, um, you know, to say, uh, you came in fast, please slow down, or next time you might not get gas, or ice cream, or whatever it is. And I think people's behavior certainly will change. My, my comment is that regarding the natural heritage features, and the mapping shows and the district's deferral and comment, and I know staff has sort of recommended maybe um, calling part of that an EP zone. I'm wondering if there's an ability to put a hold zone on that till some further studies are done to then potentially release it at that point, um, you know, to just look at it differently so we can understand more and not over encumber an EP zone on some of the property, but flag off a whole section right now for a hold zone that could be lifted under certain criteria. And I'll look at that staff perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who would like to answer that. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you, Mayor Harding, for your question. Um, <clears throat> if I'm following correctly, I think what you may be uh, suggesting is a hold zone over the area where the parking lot is proposed. Yeah, so that certainly could be, could be done, um, and the lifting of the hold uh, would require the completion of an environmental impact study. Um, so that certainly is a is an option if uh, that's something that uh, committee would like to do in this particular instance. Okay, Supplemental thank you. For me. Uh, and I, I'm not sure it was that. I thought I heard Mr. Soria suggest that we would map out an environmental area, and that was a no build zone. Um, and as opposed to just blanket up front the environmental, let's make sure we know what is the EP area, and then constrain that blanket a large area, first of all, under a hold zone to be rezoned in a specific um, impact of what is the environmental area, unless we know that exactly today. I just didn't think we did on the heritage feature. Mr. Sharp? Through you, uh, Chair Bridgman. Based on our digital mapping, Muskoka Geohub, it does delineate the boundary of the natural heritage area and the parking lot area on that lot has been designed to be outside of that map boundary. Um, so the, the map boundary is what it is, um, whether it's reflective of the actual environmental features associated with the heritage area, I have to assume it is. It is a, a line on a map, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, what we were suggesting is, is that it could be that particular portion of the heritage area that forms part of the property could be zoned EP1 as part of this process, which wouldn't require a hold. And then, um, you know, the parking area has been designed to be outside of it. And, uh, you know, it would be subject to the township site plan control process as well. So there'd be added oversight. Um, so a couple of options um, for a committee to consider the hold zone um, would be a bit more, uh, complicated and perhaps more burdensome on the applicant, whereas the second option that uh, I just um, described wouldn't be wouldn't be as burdensome. Thank you. Madam right. Chair, for clarity, I was not into a hold zone on the parking lot. It was a hold zone potentially for um, Riverstone or someone to confirm the actual confines because sometimes our web mapping is not as we know exact to where the environmental protection zone is. But if the applicant's okay with just blocking the whole thing as an EP zone, I'm okay with that as well. 
Okay, Mr. Jones, do you have a, you, you may want to think about that, but would you have a response at this point? Yeah, just to clarify, you're asking that the, where the uh, Beaumont Bay Carbonate area is where the line is going from that line north to put that into an EPA zone or the entirety of the property? Just, no, just, the, just from the line north? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I have no so, issues with that. Well, then maybe we can do that immediately. Sounds good. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, that will make uh, this a lot more, uh, a lot quicker on my end. That was going to be my point number one. Uh, so, point number two, just uh, picking up on the whole safety element, I just wanted to ask staff um, in their in any other past applications that, uh, as it relates to marinas, have there has been other approaches that have been executed or implemented that could help in this area of safety. Uh, I see Director Pink. Director Pink. Thank you, through you. Uh, we certainly had have had some interesting marina proposals in the past that has uh, drawn uh, interest from the community and have raised safety concerns and boating concerns. Uh, I think it's a kind of a reoccurring theme you may hear from me. It's not technically uh, under the authority of the Planning Act to utilize the site plan control process for those reasons. Uh, but we have in the past uh, with agreement with the property owners have come up with some uh, creative ways to try to address uh, concerns uh, through the site plan process. Uh, things like uh, marker boys, uh, potentially to encourage uh, slowing down uh, sooner uh, as you approach the marina and docking, uh, requiring uh, marina staff to be trained and be able to uh, train their patrons as to proper boating practices. I believe we required even uh, handbooks or pamphlets to be created by the marina to distribute to their uh, patrons on uh, boating practices and how to ingress and egress from the area. Uh, and then uh, even in some instances have placed hold zones on docks until speed limits get reduced uh, in the bay or uh, in a particular area. So those combination of things is what I've seen uh, in the past through various boat impact assessments that we've requested to be completed. And typically we implement those through the through the site plan process. Councilor Mazan. Thank you. And um, so uh, if these 14 slips are approved today and site plan control is going to now take care of the, or the rezoning of the, the EP zone, the site plan, you could incorporate some best practices um, i.e. The, the buoys that Mayor Harding was talking about just to help change behavior because ultimately what this is is about it, uh, kind of informing and hopefully changing behavior through all behavior or all actions on that portion of the lake. So is there a tool like if it's been historically done some kind of pamphlet that this marina could have access to? I guess that's a secondary question back to D Director Pink versus asking them to come up with something. Through the chair, I mean, I could certainly uh, try to look through the file and see if that's a public document, uh, presumably would be, and uh, we'd be happy to share if that's possible. I don't think it's uh, likely too onerous or difficult or rocket science. I think it's basic, again, good behavior practices of how uh, those boaters should uh, travel down that bay uh, when approaching the marina and simply uh, reaffirming that regularly uh, as they uh, come and go from the marina and, and arrive. Um, but certainly staff's happy to help as best we can if, if we can. And if I, just a quick final comment. I, I know that there can be the uh, the feeling that we, we all know what we're doing. There's been a lot of newcomers to the lakes in the last few years. This is not just isolated to this particular location. And um, I've had quite a bit of this type of feedback with a lot of the the rental boats and new people into the lakes that might not all just understand the etiquette or the safety concerns and what these different uh, opportunities are. So uh, consolidating that kind of information and helping all of us get a bit better at that, I think would help um, at least a, a one step forward in the safety element. So if we can incorporate that into the site plan, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, I think that's noted. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. 
Good, thank you. And through you, if I could direct a, a comment to uh, Mr. Jones. Chair, thank you. Uh, so Mr. Jones, thank you very much for coming forward and helping uh, helping ease the, the problem of, of some of the, uh, the folks up uh, Skeleton Lake way, uh, being down here, way down here in Torrance. We have our own problems, but I'm I'm appreciative of of, of the effort and how you stood up here. Um, I, I can't help but but notice the uh, the the drawing uh, showing Doc C. Uh, you you've been great with Doc B and added there. Um, was there a reason why you you didn't press on and add some more spaces on Doc C? Is it a function of the parking car parking or a shallow water? where the dock C area is. I know it's a funny request to actually see you adding more, but um, you know, th there is a problem with, uh, with spa uh, the spatial piece to it. Is there a reason why you, uh, dock C is just there and not developed any further? Yeah, so when we looked at this uh, in a with opinion uh, from others, uh, we wanted to stay, uh, we have the ability to expand up the middle that seemed to be the least, uh, I guess, it, it was. It seemed to be the best option. And going up uh, on the northern sideline, I'm sorry, I don't actually have A, B, and C in front of me, but on the northern part of the property, that dock line, our neighbor's rather close. So we didn't want to encroach on his privacy. Um, he has, uh, we see his son swimming quite a bit. So, and then on the southern port, uh, we actually, that's our main gas dock. And as well, there's the public ramp there. So we didn't, we want to do is the least amount to impede on traffic and safety. Um, we all think of boating in the daylight and things are wonderful and great. However, uh, expanding out on the gas dock didn't make sense. Somebody coming in at night, barge traffic, winds. We took a lot of things into consideration um, on how to do this. Um, that's why you'll see just going up the center, uh, that was the least uh, intrusive to our neighbors and gave us kind of the best sight line uh, throughout the marina for safety. Um, and if I could just mention one little thing with safety, um, we're part of Boating Ontario, um, as well as Clean Marine Program. So uh, Clean Marine, number one, we're under an audible process for environmental. Um, there is a voluntary audit and then a mandatory one every three years. Um, so that's just a little out of bad, out of bit here. And, and more of why I say that is just to understand the responsibility and kind of the nature of our company of how we are with the environment and boating safety. Um, with Boating Ontario, we have a plethora of information towards new boater safety uh, orientations, how to proceed through that. So giving that to our dock staff, passing it out, that's something we've already done. We can definitely do a better job at it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, at the beginning of the season, uh, getting those markers into the boats and talking to people about that, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure on uh, some of the other negative comments, just so you do know, uh, we have ceased our rental business as of last year. Um, so popping more rental boats out of Skeleton, things like that, uh, and out of Windermere as well. There are things that we just are not doing. Um, and I know with the new boater safety, uh, my orientation program, uh, from what I hear, is above and beyond many others. Um, my orientations at a minimum are an hour. Uh, with customers in new boats. So the safety factor um, and the things we're doing, and as you said, Mr. Zavitz, uh, why did we put the docks up the middle and nowhere else when really, when you look at the topographical map on that bay, there is actually a significant amount of room that doesn't look like it would encroach on anybody's privacy. Um, but that just seemed to be the best interest for everybody on the lake and most of all safety for everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. This is a uh, difficult one, but we do need uh, in that boating. And, you know, uh, what actually uh, convinced me is uh, uh, Mr. Jones's comment that they've ceased renting boats because uh, anybody uh, that is using the, the uh, dockage there, if they become a problem, they can just, just cancel their their uh, fee, uh, their uh, slip for next year. So I think everybody will will, will get in line. Um, and uh, as far as the, the site plan control, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, the uh, e e EP1 would be great. So I will support this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I also am going to support this, uh, but have a question for staff. Um, 
I noticed that the uh, boat slips are on one property and the parking appears to be on a second property. Are these properties going to merge um, or is there, has that been discussed at all? So they become one part at one property and not uh, be separately owned? Mr. Sharp. Through you, Chair Bridgman, and thanks for your question, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, for sure, they're going to merge uh, because the applicant has already submitted a deeming bylaw application um, that will be brought forward to council in May um, to merge the lot. And that will um, remove the status of the lot as a lot on a plan of subdivision affecting the, uh, the merger. So that'll, that'll you'll see that next month. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments committee? All right, then I'm gonna read the motion. Moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommended Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA 66 21, Skeleton Lake Marina Limited, Roll Number 2 20 035 and 2 20 036, be approved subject to the property and proposed development being made subject to site plan control. Any comments? All in favor? Oh, and, Ms. and Mr. Pink is voting. <laughs> okay, Mr. Pink, what would you like to say? Sorry about that. I hope we didn't tip the scales in any uh, particular way. Um, I just wanted to mention we didn't include the minor amendment to rezone TB1. I'm happy to write that in uh, as quickly as I, I can for you. I would be appreciative of that. Thank you. All right, so I have read it. We'll wait until the minor amendment comes through. Mr. Pink. The penmanship was a little rushed, but I can read it. Um, so after, uh, I don't uh, believe I have to reread it all. I'm happy to though. Uh, after the condition for site plan control, I have added N that the area of the natural heritage area on the property be rezoned to EP1. Thank you. Okay, that's what we are voting on. Any comments? All in favor? Carried. Madam Clerk, that's unanimous, I believe. So thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you very much for your time. Happy Easter to everyone. You too. Okay, and we are next, I believe it's Ms. Darling and Schlitz. I'm not sure I pronounced that properly. My apologies. I'll take it away, Ms. Darling. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. The next application to be heard is zoning bylaw Amendment application ZBA 10 slash 22, bylaw 2022 051 in the name of Schleit. The lands are known municipally as 1325 Beatrice Town Line. I'll direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 376 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows A zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted to construct an accessory residential secondary dwelling unit. An exemption is required for the maximum permitted gross floor area of an accessory residential dwelling unit of 1,195 square feet. The proposed secondary dwelling is to be 2,000 square feet. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and 11 submissions have been received to date. <clears throat> Comments were received from Nick Snyder, Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, Township Public Works Technician, Curtis Sivret, District Planner, and Eric Campbell, the Interim Fire Protection Officer. Seven letters of support were submitted from area neighbors. And these letters were from Brad Gray, Ron Colson, Larry Hi, Colleen Polston, Jackie Lynn McCochran, 
Kendra Gray and Matthew Grace, Glenn Eaton and Ann Anita Stinell. These comments were forwarded to planning committee prior to today's meeting. I've prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and staff have no concerns with the application. Uh, I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I believe Mr. Simpson is going to be with us to speak to this. Welcome, Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and, and uh, committee members. Uh, it's been a long day for you. Uh, hopefully I can shorten it up a bit. Uh, we're very pleased with the assistance that uh, Kristen's pr provided to us through this application process. My clients uh, had for earlier discussions with, with uh, her and, and Bryce and actually David Pink uh, uh, previously as well. But uh, we think we've come up with an appropriate remedy to solve uh, the uh, what the family is wanting to do and to build a second uh, a residential dwelling on that property for a family member. And uh, we, uh, we just appreciate all that's happened and we look forward to uh, um, council approving it. Uh, my clients are probably online uh, if they haven't fallen asleep by now, but uh, they're probably online to answer any questions uh, if there are any to be asked of the owners. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Simpson. Um, Elizabeth, anybody raising their hand to talk for this? The applicant is coming in. Okay, great. Uh, welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Schleit. You know, can you hear me? Okay, now we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Hi there. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're internet's a little uh, struggle here sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. Welcome to the township. But anyway. Um, could you turn on actually if you're struggling with that i suggest you actually there you go you have turned it on welcome yep, so we're... yeah so uh please go ahead as applicants and and um we'd love to hear what you have to say yeah um again keeping it short and thanks wayne and thanks kristen and the team at uh muskoka lakes there was a uh, pleasure trying to navigate through some of these challenges for sure um, as you may know, our, our initial plan was to uh, sever a piece out in order to um, build uh, with the intention of uh, being here for our parents uh, in the near future. Um, we did move up here about four years ago, um, but as time goes on, we're, we're seeming to doing a lot of travel out of Huntsville down to Bracebridge. Um, it would just make it easier and, and definitely more uh, recommended for my parents in order to be here uh, at any given time. Um, so really, there's um, the only reason we're asking really for the space increase is, is to one, um, keep some sort of standard of living that we currently have, although this would actually reduce about 25% of our current and, and we're totally good with that. Um, we do still have a college student at home um, that, you know, as you may know, needs a lot of space to roam around some days. Um, and as well as my wife's um, mother uh, is not too far away from moving in as well. So um, you know, the 1100 square feet would definitely be uh, extremely tight um, to make everybody comfortable and, and uh, to be able to accommodate everybody. So we're just blessed to be able to support our parents um, going forward. And we're, we're hoping we can get this cleared up. That's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, Elizabeth. Do you see anyone else who would like to speak? Not seeing anyone else, Barb. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to committee now and uh, Councillor Zavitz. Well, thank you. And through you, what a noble pursuit to house your parents. Uh, I can't help but notice uh, your 76.6 acres of, uh, of land size. Uh, brilliant. I certainly will support staff on this and, uh, and approve this and wish you all the best. Okay, does anybody else have any comments? 
Councilor Jagowitz. Yes, I'll be supporting it also, but I do have a question for staff and it's just, just for my information. Where did the 1195 come from in the first place? I was just curious. Is there any, any logic to that? Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman, and thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Um, in my discussions with Mr. Pink, I had the same question. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, from those discussions, um, there was really no science, I don't think, around the number other than um, perhaps uh, the decision makers or council at that time felt that that was a, a reasonable number for a accessory secondary uh, dwelling unit. Uh, perhaps Mr. Pink would like to jump in if he wishes to further elaborate as I wasn't involved in, uh, in those discussions, but um, that's my understanding. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pink, do you, would you like to say anything? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, briefly, I believe there may have been some uh, brief benchmarking uh, around. A number of municipalities were implementing that direction from the province at the time. Uh, but as Mr. Sharp indicated, I don't believe there was any uh, great science to it. A number had to be chosen. Uh, we wanted to ensure that this was still an accessory or secondary. Uh, size was felt appropriate. Um, but certainly we can review uh, proposals such as this on, on large properties. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, that would have been my comment too, especially on these rural properties to allow secondary homes that allow families to look after each other. I think we're all in, in agreement on that. So uh, whether we need to do something with our comprehensive zoning bylaws or whatever, we'll just keep that in mind going forward as we, as we continue to review. So any other comments? All right, I'm going to read the motion. Moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommends to Township Council that Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-10-22, Schleit Roll Number 9-12-014 be approved. Any comments? All in favor? It's carried. Carried. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that finishes our public meeting and we are now going to go on to our uh, long range planning. So uh, we have a delegation here for fusion, which is gonna go back, Joe and Kevin Fawcett. And, um, and uh, said 50, I hate to mess that name up. If we could bring them in, Elizabeth, that would be great. And planner one. So who is going to introduce this? Sorry, I, oh. That would be there me. You, there you are, Caitlin. Okay, sorry. That's All right, okay. so, Thank you, so let's, let's get it introduced and then we'll have our delegation speak. Perfect. So the next application to be heard is a cash in lieu of parking application, CP01-22, in the name of 821284 Ontario Incorporated, or more commonly known as Portside Fusion. The subject property is known municipally as 98 Joseph Street. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 389 of the agenda package. A request has been made for a cash in lieu of parking for five parking spaces. The applicant proposes to expand an existing restaurant patio. The proposed patio addition will be 1,520 square feet. Staff have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. Staff recommend that the cash in lieu of parking application CP01-22 be approved and that a cash in lieu of, par of parking agreement be entered into with um, 821284 Ontario Inc. Portside Fusion for five parking spaces. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. So Mr. Fawcett, we would love to hear from you. So please go ahead, just your address too, before you address us. Hello, Madam Chair, uh, 98 Joseph Street, uh, Port Carling, the property in question. Okay, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so, we are obviously looking to expand the deck, um, get a little more seating in the restaurant. I mean, with what's gone on in the last year, I don't think people are ever gonna 
want to go back to, you know, sitting back to back like restaurants used to do. And uh, we're trying to make some more space in town. And I think we got a great view back there. I don't know if you guys know the property, but uh, overlooking the river there, uh, I'd really like to spruce things up, make it a lot nicer for the town and everybody and just be able to grow the restaurant a little. So that's what we're looking to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee, any comments? Councillor Kelly, you look like you're trying to get your hand on there. So Councillor Kelly. Thank you and through you, just simply to say, uh, I'm gonna support this uh, great corporate citizen, certainly making the most of the land that's available to them right there. And uh, so it's gonna have my vote. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Savitz. Thank you, and thank you, and through you. Uh, just again, relating to um, a, an earlier situation and a like uh, situation in Bala um, for the Bala, Bala pub, um, did we not give uh, a couple of year extension based on the whole COVID scenario that, um, that in fact, this fine gentleman wouldn't, uh, entrepreneur would not have to pay for a few years. So if I'm wrong, I don't know how I am, but uh, I'm pretty sure that in, in Bala, we, we gave him an extension or there, we, ex we, there was some sort of an extension granted. I do not believe that they paid the, uh, the rather sizable amount. And, and I think it was going to come back in a few years. Is that, can we get clarification from that through David, uh, David? Chair, sure. please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, through you. Uh, yes, I believe the Economic Development uh, Committee did discuss this uh, at length as did uh, Planning Committee. And what was decided was um, that proposals that come forward, uh, we can defer collection of payment, uh, I believe for two years uh, from the date. And I believe that is outlined uh, in the report. And I believe we're, uh, again, I believe it's in the report, I can double check, but uh, I believe we were going to offer that until January uh, and then uh, essentially a deferral of the collection of the payment for two years if the applicant wishes. And that was offered to the uh, applicant in Bala and I believe would be offered to the current applicant as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you and through you and I will be quick because uh, I uh, I support what Councillor Kelly said. This is an important business in Port Carling and wonderful to see it getting improved and trying to leverage the beautiful view you do have in the back. So uh, I'm fully supportive of that and just wanted to uh, comment. I was actually going to highlight that deferral of payments portion as well, just to be sure that that was noted and on the record. So thanks and good luck. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you very much. I will support this. And if you check on page 385, it does say the fee is uh, deferred for two years. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? I am going to read the motion. Be it resolved, uh, moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Kelly, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that cash in lieu of parking application CP 01 slash 22. 821284 Ontario Inc. Portside Fusion be approved and a cash in lieu of parking agreement be entered into with 821284 Ontario Inc. Portside Fusion for five parking spaces. Any comments? All in favor? That is Sorry. unanimous, Madam Clerk. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fawcett. Thank you for your time, everyone. Okay. All right, so the next uh, on our item is uh, uh, Director Pink uh, in terms of the zoning bylaw for commercial, commercial motor vehicles in excess one ton capacity in residential zones. Mr. Pink? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I believe uh, committee members will recall, I believe it was at the last uh, planning committee meeting, uh, we did have a discussion uh, regarding uh, the potential restriction uh, or uh, I guess waiving of the limitation of one ton uh, commercial vehicles 
in residential zones. Uh, committee requested some further information on rural zoning. Uh, the staff report uh, hopefully does outline that uh, in clarity for committee, but again, happy to answer any questions in that regard. Committee also requested information on current fees for a minor variance application, which again is included in the report. Uh, staff also did meet uh, with councillors Hayes and Ishikawa as was requested. We had a uh, very uh, thorough discussion. It was very helpful and uh, staff did conduct some further research. I uh, learned a lot about uh, trucks and the capacity limitations and um, what uh, essentially I believe we've concluded is that uh, the common uh, nomenclature of half ton, three quarter ton, one ton is quite dated, it dates back to original capacities of trucks, which uh, are now capable of uh, much higher payloads, yet the naming uh, has sort of stuck. So to uh, resolve any potential uh, confusion or potential enforcement issues, as much as staff, uh, again, in my experience, uh, has not uh, arisen in the past, uh, but just to ensure that that uh, would not occur, uh, staff can recommend that that uh, section of the zoning bylaw be amended uh, to refer to uh, a weight classification as opposed to a payload measurement. So if trucks uh, continue to improve in their technical specifications, uh, we will not have to regularly update our zoning bylaw. Um, it really will be a question of the, the weight or size of a truck that council feels suitable um, in order to ensure that uh, residential areas maintain that character. So again, um, I believe that's all outlined in the report, but I am available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you, that was a very productive meeting that we had with David. Um, and I'm happy to see the description is updated. Uh, we did talk about grandfathering, which is not mentioned in the bylaw. Um, I just had a question for David. The $1,400 for a minor variance, that would not apply to the grandfathering as we talked about it um, for, for you know, businesses that have had trucks on their properties for many decades. I, I just wanna make sure that that is, is clear. Dr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Uh, that is correct. Uh, bylaw does not have to refer to grandfathering. It's, uh, it's a given that if uh, any use or any building uh, was lawfully established in accordance with the rules at the time, that continue and there's no need to apply for a minor variance and those legal rights remain and those buildings and uses uh, can continue. If an owner chooses to expand their operation or enlarge their building uh, or relocate their buildings, then potentially applications need to be made. But uh, uses uh, can continue. Uh, there's no uh, need to reference that in the bylaw and, uh, and the minor variance would not apply in that case. Okay, thank you. Uh, a supplementary. Um, we talked about having a garage and I appreciate that Mr. Pink has now recommended uh, perhaps landscaping. Landscaping means different things to different people. And if someone is just parking a truck in their driveway overnight, for work purposes, um, there really wouldn't be too much landscaping. And is this going to take the time of our staff to decide whether or not that area is properly landscaped? I don't want to put any more work on staff than necessary. I would be happy if it just said one vehicle, period. Mr. Pink? Uh, staff didn't recommend uh, the change, although did suggest that the committee could consider it if there's concern about having to house uh, the one uh, commercial vehicle inside a garage. What you could consider alternatively is a landscape buffer. Uh, I don't know if it would necessarily mean any additional uh, administrative or, or enforcement hardship. It would be a question of whether it's in a garage or in this case, whether it's uh, screened by a buffer. Um, my preference is typically not to go with the landscape buffer. I think it is debatable about controlling vegetation and a zoning bylaw. Uh, however, our zoning bylaw does contain a landscape buffer definition. It's a continuous row of trees or shrubs, not less than six feet high. So I think it's fairly clear uh, what it would have to be uh, in order to meet uh, those requirements. But um, you know, to really drill down a little further, Obviously, it's a little bit easier to know whether something's in a garage uh, or argue whether something is 
uh, truly a, a shrub a row or buffer or not. Um, but again, I know there was some concern or questions from committee as to whether that was an onerous requirement to have to park uh, com large commercial trucks inside a garage. So staff suggested, um, you know, consideration can be given to that alternative for a landscape buffer. Thank you. So, Councillor Hayes, if I could just be clear on this, you would prefer not to have anything. It doesn't have to be in a garage, but we don't. We're not going to say you have to have a buffer otherwise. I, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, I would like it to say that um, the owner makes every effort to um, hide the truck from in some kind of wording. Um, because a garage isn't always an option and neither is landscaping. And in some instances, um, it's only temporary. It might be for, you know, two or three weeks, uh, two or three days of a week that I'm driving the truck and it's parked in my driveway. So it's not something that's there all the time. Um, and I believe we also talked about adding some kind of wording during um, construction so that should um, a property be under construction that the parking of the large vehicles for long periods of time would be suspended. Okay, um, do I have any, anybody have any comments on those two things? So the first would be that we just simply encourage the owners to have a buffer if it's not inside a garage, if I understand you properly. And the other would be that when a property is under construction, uh, we basically will suspend this bylaw. I think that's the other way that that's so. Do I have support for for just, we do not need the, the uh, vegetative buffer or the, the landscaping buffer? Who would support not having that in this? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Okay, I think we've got that for when it goes out to the public, Director Pink. And then the other part is, um, do we suspend this during construction? I guess my question would be, how often do we get a complaint during construction that there's vehicles parked on the property? I've always just assumed it goes with the territory. So Director Pink, do we... Do we have any any issues with that? Again, I'm not aware of any past issues, any past complaints. Obviously, it's standard practice for construction vehicles to be on construction sites. I've not known this to be an issue. However, if uh, council again is concerned, we can add uh, explicit reference in the bylaw that it wouldn't apply to ongoing construction activity. Uh, just to be abundantly clear, um, so staff is clear when crafting the bylaw, uh, no requirement to be in a garage, no requirement for landscape buffer. So one uh, commercial vehicle in excess of uh, 7,500 kilograms, and it does not have to be in a garage or a landscape buffer. Was that the consensus? I believe so. Thank you. Unless somebody says differently. Uh, Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I understand the concept of a construction uh, vehicle. I, I wonder whether we're creating a loophole uh, to literally drive a semi tractor trailer through, so to speak, in the fact that I take an open work permit out to construct a shed, and it sits on my property for three or four years as an open work permit, and I never close it. Um, you know, I, I just I wouldn't want that type of an abuse to be done for somebody who says I want to park that truck there. So um, <clears throat> I like where we're going in this. And I think, uh, you know, the discretion of if it's a construction zone, someone's building a house or someone's building a property uh, that uh, our bylaw enforcement are going to offer that discretion. But I think to actually state that in a bylaw might create some additional uh, uh, issues for us, potentially. Let's hear from uh, our expert, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Welcome, Mr. Kennedy. Good afternoon, uh, Council. Uh, just to confirm on David's point with the complaints, we have not received any complaints um, in regards to commercial vehicles or construction vehicles being on a property while under construction. 
Okay, thank you. So I, my preference would be just to leave it out, not, not highlight that, but can I again get a reading on that? We're not going to put this, we are not going to put wording in. Have I got a reading on that? Do I have enough people? Yeah, yes. So, okay. Um, I think we've got that. And I believe that we are going to, are we, we are putting in an amendment on this motion? Lauren, is that, that's what we're doing? Okay, so we'll wait for Mr. Pink to do that, and then I will actually ask him to read this motion uh, once he's got that amendment done. Okay, Mr. Pink. Okay, thank you. So moved by Councillor Jaglowitz, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that staff be directed to prepare an amendment to Section 328H of Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 2014-14, as outlined in Staff Report Plan 2022-73, together with the removal of the requirement to be stored in a private garage, and that a public meeting be scheduled in accordance with Planning Act requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Any discussion? All in favor? Madam Crook, that carries. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to just leave uh, Director Pink's report um, on More Homes and Everyone Act. Uh, we'll do that after. We deal with our unfinished business and then uh, and then we'll have Mr. Sif come in after that as our other delegate. So we're going to move right now to 12A. And Mr. Sharp, I believe you are up for this one. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, concurrent official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications have been submitted in the name of Lateo. The subject property is known municipally as 1143 Torrance Road, and it fronts onto Black Lake. A dwelling garage and a dock have been enlarged in the absence of building permits. The official plan amendment has been submitted to allow lot coverages to exceed 8.8% or one-tenth of the maximum uh, permitted lot coverage amount. The zoning bylaw amendment was originally submitted for exemptions from lot coverage, accessory building height, and cumulative dock width requirements. In March, council deferred the matters back to planning committee uh, for further consideration. The applicants have now revised the proposal by reducing lot coverage amounts by 433.7 square feet, resulting in percentage amounts of 11.7% over the area of the entire lot and 13.7% over the area of the lot within 200 feet from the high water mark. The applicants now propose to improve a side yard setback of an existing dock. The applicants now propose to eliminate an exemption from the cumulative dock width requirement by bringing the dock into compliance with this requirement. A detailed revegetation plan has been prepared for the property by Riverstone Environmental Solutions Incorporated. The applicants now propose to remove a sun deck in the front yard area and incorporate this area into Riverstone's revegetation plan. And finally, the applicants also now propose to remove an upper level sun deck associated with the two-story garage. No new public uh, or agency submissions have been received since the February planning committee meeting. Stefan Sherback of Planscape Incorporated who is the applicant's agent, has prepared a letter dated April 7, 2022, addressing the revised proposal, and it has been forwarded to planning committee for your review. I have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff continue to have concerns and have rec recommended that the official plan amendment not be adopted 
and that bylaw 2020-103 be defeated. Notwithstanding my recommendation, alternatives are addressed in my report. I have no further comments at this time and I would be happy to take any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. All right, so we do, I, Mr. Zerbach is here and Mr. Lateo. So if we could bring them in. Okay, I believe you're both here. There's Mr. Lateo, Mr. and Mrs. Lateo. And uh, are you going to speak at this point? Is Mr. Zerbach going to make any comments, Mr. Lateo? I'll be speaking right now. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Just your address. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee. My name is Tom Lateo and I reside at 1143 Torrance Road. Thank you once again for giving us hope for this council is, is doing everything within their powers to assist my family with this situation. We truly appreciate you sending us back to the drawing board to present our best foot forward. We had um, a discussion with our planner and the construction engineer on the best possible solution. Uh, please know that these final changes were made after many personal discussions and considerations on our envision what the property will look like and function. This is if you agree with our latest revised uh, plan. The particular numbers in the planning report speak for themselves. Um, you can clearly see a progress uh, towards the, the targets in the zoning by law. Um, although from the a numerical perspective, it may still seem large. Uh, please remember that we submitted an official plan amendment to address this. Um, please look closely at the overall size of the request. It is not a large request, especially when you look at the other properties in our neighborhood. Uh, th this is not the largest home in the lake. Our property and the existing development has, has formed part of the community um, for many years without any issues until this point. At the last meeting, I understand that many other properties along the lake may have had the ability to enjoy larger lot coverage than what is permitted today, which again, uh, forms part of the character for this lake. Um, the shoreline will be replanted as, uh, as stated uh, to provide additional screening. And for those who are not familiar with our property, uh, you cannot see these existing structures from the road. We would hope that one or more of you have a chance of heart and would reconsider your vote so we can finally enjoy our home that we purchased. Uh, do not forget about the additional information that I provided to you on the last meeting and based on your recent directions before you is our best uh, foot forward at this time. We will kindly request council reconsideration of our application and more importantly, your support. Thanks so much. and. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Mateo. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Zerbach speaking at this point? Stefan, are you? No? You're here to answer questions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, committee, I have comments. I have... Anyone have any comments? Okay. I'm going to, I was going to give my comment. All right, Councillor Zavitz, I will wait until you're finished. You... Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, comments. Um, here we are again, hopefully the last time. Um, it, one of the things that touches me on this particular file is um, when, I, when I see the, uh, the proposal from uh, November, and then I see the one from March, and now I see the one in April. I quite honestly am embarrassed to be here looking at what these folks have come back with in April, because quite honestly, uh, I thought March March was it. Uh, for us to ask, I mean, we're into the chainsaw territory here where we're going to go on their property and start cutting off things that are vital and 
integral parts of their building in terms of design, et cetera. Um, I mean, I, I think it's great that they've come uh, this, uh, they've, they've come hat in hand, but I think, I think we've gone too far to be quite honest. And I, I, I let, let my case be stated uh, last month. Uh, we're good enough to have it back at planning here and now, but I, um, I have to be honest with you. Um, I would prefer just to, for the record that uh, we went back to the March uh, numbers. If, if anybody could go to the property and see what they're suggesting they're going to give up, it's kind of ridiculous, to be honest, looking at other files that we've been looking at today. So that, that'll be my, uh, you know, I, obviously, I want this to happen and want them to be able to go away and have live their lives. But um, I, I think we, given the situation, I think we've taken a little bit too much of the pie. Thank you. Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, contrary to uh, Councillor Zavitz, I, I do appreciate that we are trying to get more into conformity and every little bit helps here um, when we look at uh, overall lot coverage. Uh, two quick questions. One uh, to Lateos. Uh, you know, the first time you came us to visit us, um, you were represented by a lawyer, I believe, from Title Insurance. Um, and have do they continue to discuss with you, obviously, um, they probably don't want to pay anything out at the end of the day. Um, they would, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming they have offered some compensation should this not go through. So that's a question to you. And then the second question, either to Mr. Serbeck or yourselves, one of the things we're contemplating in our official plan beyond lot coverage is that of uh, undisturbed lot. And based on the site plan that I'm looking at, we have a significant driveway coverage on this lot, and it's probably exceeding 20% of the lot uh, perspective from a disturbed lot point. And maybe the other way to help counsel through this is as opposed to not only taking down parts of buildings from a lot coverage, but we increase vegetation um, you know, on some of the driveway components to renaturalize some of those driveways. I don't know if that has been contemplated in this at all. So I'll turn those two uh, questions to uh, Lateos and Mr. Serbeck. Mr. Lateo. Uh, yes. Uh, so based on the insurance, uh, we don't know how much they'll pay for it. So at this point, because we don't know an answer, so they, they're not giving an answer as well. Um, in relation to the driveway, we're willing to whatever. If you have a plan for the driveway, we're always willing to work and, and figure out some kind of vegetation uh, uh, to plan maybe, uh, you know, to change. Um, yes, it, 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 it is a driveway that goes up to the house. Uh, but if you have any other idea that uh, we can probably plant some other plants or, or trees, uh, um, we're always open. Okay, Madam thanks. Chair, if I may, just a supplemental then to staff's perspective, um, have we contemplated any kind of, uh, or what would staff's perspective be if there was increased vegetation on some of the driveway or portion of the driveway um, to offset some of the uh, built form on the property? Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Thank you, Mayor, for your question. You know, I think our focus is often the first 50 feet being the shoreline buffer, the ribbon of life, as uh, Councillor Roberts would refer to it. Uh, and that's usually our focus. But, um, you know, in this context, given the lot coverage amounts, um, we're advocates for well vegetated properties, be it, uh, you know, 50 feet from shore or, um, you know, 66 feet or 100 feet from shore, whatever the case may be. So if that was something that Council uh, or Planning Committee was, uh, was looking to implement, um, that could certainly uh, be done. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I would say much along the line uh, that uh, Councillor Zavitz had said, I'm not quite sure what more we're trying to squeeze out of these people. I found the mayor's comments or questioning the applicant about their insurance policy, uh, not a planning matter. In fact, I, I found it very insulting. Um, 
after watching and listening to so many other applications that have come through, and we we allow much, I would say, uh, challenging things uh, on bigger lakes. This is just a small little community. And honestly, if you looked at their driveway, because the picture obviously doesn't show it very, like the site plan wouldn't show it. It's a very high grade on their driveway. I don't know, planting a tree in the middle of the driveway, what that is supposed to get us out of all of this. Like, it feels like we're trying to get something from these people just to, but. Councilor yeah. Mr. Carmel, could we stay please. positive, please? No, I just would like to the, the... There's nothing positive about this. There's nothing positive about this. What we're trying, what I've heard so far from the mayor is that we're trying to squeeze more. And that really distresses me. And I'm sorry if it distresses you the way I speak. Just trying to keep everything on a relative basis here. Councillor This Hayes? is not. Councillor Hayes. Thank you and through you. Um, I thought back in March that we were at some kind of a, I felt that that was about as much as they could give. They've come back and they've said, we've found another couple of things that, that, that we're willing to give up just to get this settled. And I think that we are at a point now where there is nothing more. So I would definitely support this today. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I supported this in March. They've uh, had all their neighbors have been in support of this. Uh, they've they've, they've uh, come back and taken some more off. So I would definitely support it. And, you know, staff and that comments, I can remember when I started on uh, community adjustment here, anybody asked for over 11, uh, over 10%, uh, it was recommended to turn it down because that was in our, uh, our uh, uh, in that bylaws. So staff are, 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 are not gonna come up and say, yes, it is because it is over law coverage. It's up to us and we can, we can grant that and that. And it's a shame that they've had to come back so many times uh, and that, but anyway, I will be supporting it. I would even support going back to, to, to March 22nd and that taking a post off here and a post off there, it, it isn't right. Nobody else has complained about this. And it's been up there for over 10 years. Thank you. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. As you know, this has been in front of us many times and I have struggled with it. And um, so now it's time for me to, to make a decision. And um, my decision is I'm going, to I'm going to support it. And the reason is I'm going to use a uh, respected planners uh, advice. And I'll read what, uh, what, what I use to make my decision. It is our opinion, the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications are consistent with the 2020 provincial policy statement conform to the official plan of the Muskoka planning area in keeping with the direction of the township's official plan and zoning bylaw, and as a result, represent good planning. And they went on to say in the most recent letter, finally, the request is supported by the District of Muskoka, in brackets, approval authority for the OPA, and the applications do not offend any District of Muskoka official plan policies. And I'm torn, but I, I am uh, I'm going to support this. Thank you. Councillor Savitz. Uh, thank you, thank you, <clears throat> through you. Um, so here we are doing our public proclamation. So, I mean, I counted it five and five, we're right where we were before. So a month later, these folks have come hat in hand, uh, you know, chopping off this and a post here and there, as my good uh, friend, uh, and Mr. Edwards says, um, again, I don't, know, I don't know what the mechanism is here. Uh, are we reaching too far to, to try to roll this back to March and, and then hope to get a 6-4 vote out of this? I mean, 
I don't know either. And this is, I guess this is a strategic piece here and now. Um, but quite honestly, I, I, I want this to happen. So I will support the April piece, but I think it's ridiculous. And I would implore this group to, to pull it back to March and not talk about putting trees on a driveway. Phil, you got to go to the driveway and see their driveway, please, with all due respect. I don't know why we'd be taking a driveway away. This is, I don't know how we got here, but I'd like to see us move on. So that's my two cents. Okay, before you speak again, Mayor Harding, I am not going to support this. I know that's where I have been from the beginning. I was hoping for more of a reduction when it came back this time. In a true planning sense, this is so far over our allowed coverage. I simply cannot support this. Had the garage come down, I think that would have made a massive difference. But I just don't see enough movement to allow me to, to support it on a planning basis. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. And I, just uh, for those who feel I'm being derogatory, to Lateos, it, it was a start at the beginning of this meeting that Lateo said, thank you for continuing to work with us. Um, and that's in my opinion, uh, when it came to council that we may have had a five, five vote, which would not have moved it forward. Hence the reason we're back here discussing. Um, I do appreciate the willingness for the Lateos to continue to work with us. Uh, Chair Bridgman made the comment that we are still so far over. There's still going to be people around this table who may not support this application. Um, and I can tell you, I want to support this application. I want to support the Lacteos remaining in the property. My question about a driveway or a added vegetation is and was to our planning staff, does that help change our planning staff's recommendation? I appreciate Councilor Jaglitz. A planner made a recommendation and he's gonna follow that. Our own two planners, independent, uh, Mr. Pink, um, and Mr. Sharp have recommended against this. The alternative section of this report is where I'm leaning at this particular point. And that is to approve this uh, first and second reading at time, some changes would have to be made. Uh, my preference again, would just asking staff, is there any opportunity for increased vegetation? Um, I'll leave that to a staff comment. I'm not going to micromanage. No, I have not driven down the driveway. I'm looking at a, a numbers, which many people do. And, um, but as I say, I want to try and work with Lateos. And I think I appreciate that Lateos have been trying to work with this committee. Um, so I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa. I would suggest that we would be reading three, three readings today. I would like, um, the Lateos to be able to get on with it if they need to then um, approach their lawyer to actually defend them like everyone else does against the OMB which or whatever we're going to call it today land tribunal that they have that ability but we have not allowed them that ability at this time um, you know we keep deferring and deferring and deferring and even now we're hearing well, we may not re have three readings. Give them some direction so they can go to the next step because we all know there's a next step and it, it involves lawyers and it involves tax dollars that are going to affect all of our taxpayers because of this decision. But making them wait and wait and wait for a decision from this council is not correct. Hey, thank you. I agree, Councillor Nishikawa. I think we need to come to a decision today. There, I don't think there's any question of that. So, oh, Councillor Zavitt, sorry. Uh, thank you. It's for you. I have two requests. First of all, well, I, I guess just the one. I, I would ask for a recorded vote, and I would ask for it in reverse. Thank you. That's me Me always at the front and you always at the back, right, Councillor Zavitt? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so we had a suggestion of maybe going back to, I, I'm just gonna try and wrap this up, going back to our March numbers. I'm not getting a sense that that is what committee would like to do here. So we will stay where we are with this. And then uh, Madam Clerk, if I could get a little direction from you 
uh, to Councillor Nishikawa's point, if we pass this right now, we do three, we can do three readings. We can't, I didn't think we could. So, okay, uh, we will we will vote on this then. And at the moment, I'm trying to find the, here we go. Okay, I've got it. All right, uh, recorded vote. So uh, I will read the motion and then I will turn it over to the clerk. Uh, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by uh, Councillor Zavitz, uh, be it resolved that planning committee recommends a township council that official plan amendment. Is that my first one I should be reading? Sorry, I again need some direction, uh, uh, Madam Clerk. And if I could just clarify from Councillor Zavitz. Just... <laughs> I think through you, <laughs> if I could just uh, clarify through Councillor Zavitz, is he requesting a reverse recorded vote on all of the motions to be read on this matter or just the first? All. all. Great. Okay, I didn't get an answer to my question. Is the first one um, official plan amendment? Sorry, Lauren. We're just making one quick change. Uh, Chair Bridgman, we'll be right back. Okay. I don't like working off off site. Count, <laughs> Councillor Jaglowitz has his has a uh, question. I see that. Thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like a clarification, if you don't mind. Um, when I said I was supporting this, I I was on the basis that we of of staff's uh, alternative that said if should committee be considered recommending recommending this, they would recommend the following. And I'm confused. Are you calling this question in the affirmative or in the negative? I'm just, yeah. <laughs> just make it clear so we all understand what we're voting on. No, I understand. I understand why you're confused. And I don't, I, I appreciate you don't have five different votes. Is it, can it not just be one vote? Well, we, there's an official plan amendment that's being asked for too. So I'm not sure that we do the official plan amendment but I believe all the conditions go into the first motion. Isn't that what we found before? So just as long as we're so clear, I, 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 when I indicated my support, it was based on the fact that, that, that staff were suggesting if we, that would be a, a motion in the affirmative to approve it with those uh, five or six bullets included. Correct. If I might, with all due respect, that that makes no sense at all. We we you're going to read a motion. It's going to have six caveats. That doesn't make sense to me at all. I'm, I either we either vote this thing yes or no. We're going to support it or not. But I don't think it should be uh, voted uh, for. But then with six more things, we must have read them right in. No, no, no. That's what we're doing. That's what I, that's I, what I, I asked for. Yeah, Ridiculous. no, no. The, the motion has everything in it, Councillor Zavitz. Well, it'll never pass. <laughs> no, okay. that's not. I don't think that's true. Um, okay. <laughs> Madam what? Clerk, I am reading that motion first because we won't get to the OPA unless the first motion passes, I would assume. It doesn't need to be a reverse anything. Uh, Chair, just, Chair Bridgman, I'm actually going to request uh, we take a five minute uh, break and maybe we can just uh, come back in five minutes if that's okay with the committee. That's a great idea. Time for a time for a comfort stop. Uh, let's make it 2.30.
Okay, if I can get everybody back again. Okay, so I think I may have been misunderstanding what uh, both Councillor Zavitz and Councillor Nishikawa were trying to communicate about the motion. So let me tell you what my understanding is now and, and uh, see if that clarifies things. So the motion as I have it uh, contains the, um, the six bullet points that are in the report on the restrictions on this property if it's approved okay so the motion is to approve it but we're going to approve it with um the removal of the sun decks the extra stuff that they have agreed to remove at this point so that's what i am going to be reading if we all agree on that i thought that perhaps it was councillor zavitz and and councillor nishikawa who don't want any of those restrictions put in, just simply say, approve it. So now I think we're confusing Councillor Zavitz. So, uh, Mayor Harding, can you do this better than I can? I may be able to help a little bit. So the recommendation or the alternative section, staff were saying, turn it down. Uh, where Councillor Jagowitz, I think has gotten to is that uh, we would ag agree to all the additional removal that gets us to an 11% lot coverage or whatever the numbers were, 11.7 overall and 13.7. However, the alternative section of this report will come into play at council. It will not come into play today. We will be moving this to council. We're not giving it any readings. We're just recommending to town council and I'll have the clerk uh, confirm me. But when we get to town council, we can give it first and second reading and we can withhold third reading potentially until this is done, which is what staff are saying as an alternative today. The alternative section is not in play today. The uh, withdrawal, I think the resolution today is to go to their recommendation of the proposed April 2022. Hope that clarifies. Well, actually it doesn't because it is in play today on the motion. It's in my motion that I have in front of me, Mayor Hardy. So uh, those alternatives are what, uh, If I let me keep it simple. What I I'm going to read to you and what we're voting on is what has been agreed to as of today. What you're seeing in front of you, the Lateos have agreed to when they went back from the end of March to April. So if we pass this today, we are agreeing to them doing, uh, keeping their place, with just these few changes from March to April, but the rest of it, they will be able to, to keep. So I, I, that is what we're voting on today. And we can only do two readings. Um, the third reading would have to go to, to council anyway, but I think if we just pass these today, it goes on to council for final approval in a month. And I, I know you have a question, Councilor Jagowitz, so please uh, go ahead. Just a clarification, Chair, and I think we have to get this right. The way I read this, we were we would be withholding third reading until those things were completed. Now, if that's my misunderstanding, I'm not necessarily saying that's what I'm proposing, but that's the way I read it. So let's have it clear. Are, are we giving them the approval and then if they don't do the things, we're stuck, or I thought we were withholding third reading until they were accomplished. But just, just, just so you know, I will support it either way. I just want clarity. Yeah, uh, uh, our clerk, Lauren. So with the with the committee structure, our committees they make recommendations to council. So there will be no readings of any bylaws in committee today. All there will be is a recommendation and that recommendation will go to council for, for readings then. Um, but if you have specific questions on what could happen with the council planning process, maybe I'll, I'll ask director Pink to chime in, but this is all, all that is before you in planning committee today is a recommendation that will be made to council. And at that point there will be other readings of bylaws.
Does that help, Councillor Jagowitz? We're moving a motion to recommend I, to council. I understand that, and I have no problem with that. But what I understand, we're recommending to council that council withhold third reading until the changes have been made. That's my understanding. If that's incorrect, once again. All right. That's not right. Okay. Please, Councillor Zavitz. Um, so, Director Pink, can you answer that? Are we, we want to withhold third reading until all of this has been accomplished? You, uh, through you, the way the alternative section is written and therefore the draft resolution we've prepared accordingly would be to recommend that third reading be withheld. Now, again, as the clerk pointed out, uh, planning committee does not have authority to pass bylaws. So you can't give three readings to a bylaw today. All the committee can do is make a recommendation to council. At council, um, you would have the first resolution before you is to pass a bylaw to adopt the OPA. And then you would have another resolution to give first and second reading. And then at that point, you could potentially withhold a uh, third reading to consider. Now, I think um, if I sensed what uh, uh, the issue is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe several councillors, Councillor Zabitz and Ishikawa have indicated they don't agree with the restrictions. So if it's read that way, you may vote that down. Um, however, if it's read without them, perhaps there's not a majority that agree with it. So I sense that committee needs to determine whether uh, a majority of you are willing to live with the original proposal. And we can read the very brief resolution, which is simply to recommend to council uh, to approve the OPA and the ZBA, or whether we read the entire resolution and a majority of council can live with the added restrictions. Um, but uh, if I've obviously the alternative is to defeat it, and I don't get the sense that's uh, uh, desired. Okay, um, CAO Hammond. Madam Chair, and good afternoon, committee, uh, my, and my apologies. Could, could we take a, a, a quick one minute break so I can confer with Mr. Pink on the uh, the, the notion of the uh, withholding third reading of the zoning bylaw. It's a kind of a technical discussion that I wanted to have with him. It'll, I promise it will, will be very brief. It, it may add some clarity to the conversation here, Madam Chair. No, no, that's fine. Um, so we will take a uh, one minute break. <laughs> This is where we should be advertising safe boating and and the right way to be on the lakes and all that stuff, right? Because we've had a lot of these today. So I I don't we can pro progress, um, Councillor Zavitz, until we come back into um, official sitting here. But I will give you a chance to speak so, for sure. So you're allowed to talk, Chair Bridgman, but we're not. Is that the deal? To talk, but I, if we don't if we don't talk about the topic at hand, you're more than welcome to talk. <laughs> okay. Talk that would help fill in the time. Okay. <laughs> Anyone been outside? It looks like it's getting nice. Well, listen, I, I might speak to to your point, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, this is doesn't have to be about this, but I I, I want to recall that the, yesterday in one of our sessions that the mayor did say on this topic that the reason this has come back to planning is his words to do the heavy lifting. And that's what we need to do today, heavy lifting. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So. Well, uh, can I, I'm not going to discuss it, but you will actually put something on the screen for us to read before we vote. Is that, is that the idea? So we know what we're voting on? That's all. Well, I, I think that's a really good suggestion. If at, not, at, I don't at know. This point. Yeah, just so we all know, because if it isn't worded the way I want, I will vote it down and others probably feel the same way. So as long as we know what it is. Well, at this point, we yeah. need to put it on the screen, Councillor Jagowitz. Yeah, and Mr. Mr. Pink, I think, was suggesting we might have to deal with a couple of the kinks in it, or, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, anyway I, nobody answered my question. Was, was anyone outside? <laughs> I guess not. Looks like spring's coming. Haven't we all been in here all day? <laughs> yeah, where were you, Frank? <laughs> well, we had a, we had a break. Is it take oh, yeah. <laughs> I've almost got all my sap lines down. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I admired uh, Chair Bridgman's optimism that somebody's still watching to, to see the uh, safe voting message. <laughs> well, I think we talk about state minute. counseling. It, it's only two forty-five. We've got another four or five <laughs> hours to go, don't we? <laughs> oh, I hope not. <laughs> oh. But you have to you have to give a compliment to the mayor for his uh, meeting um, yesterday. If you take out the closed session, he did the entire council meeting in, I think, one hour and one minute. Yeah, but there's no heavy lifting there. <laughs> yeah, but I, we've still, uh, planning still had the shortest council meeting, special meeting, because we had to come back one day just to read a motion and vote on it and leave again. I think it was uh -huh. 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. We ready again, everybody? <laughs> okay, we're back in session. Um, so. Um, David, do you want to speak before I go on to Councillor Nishikawa? If I may, Chair, thank you. I, hopefully, again, this helps clarify. I just had a discussion with the CEO, and there was just some questions about the intent or the reasoning behind withholding third reading, and I, I sense that might be creating some confusion amongst committee. Uh, that's just a standard uh, recommendation of staff when buildings need to be removed. It just It's to ensure that the buildings actually get removed, because once you approve the bylaw, you largely lose your leverage. And we have run into situations where owners have not followed through on their promises or obligations. Um, I don't think that necessarily has to be resolved today. Uh, as we said a number of times, this is simply a recommendation to council. Council a month from now can decide whether we need to withhold third reading to do those things or whether uh, not. I think as Mayor Harding suggested, uh, the other option is just to read it uh, as is, but I think you know, without any conditions, but that is essentially just punting this decision down the road for one month. Um, so I think at the end of the day, I think what the dilemma is, some councillors don't seem to agree with the restrictions and some agree with them. Uh, so again, I believe if I heard Councillor Jagielowicz correctly at the very end, you did indicate you would approve it in either way um, without the restrictions or with them. If that is correct, my sense of the room and the votes, that would be a 6-4 approval without any restrictions, which just so that committee's clear, what that means is the Lateo's application would be approved as it was in front of council last month, which is um, not the restrictions. And again, is presumably if all the councillors' positions have remained unchanged and Councillor Jagu in favor of it, um, that may be the simplest way is to read uh, the very brief resolution before you, Chair Bridgman, uh, that simply approves of it. Um, if, if that's correct, uh, you might want to take a straw poll. Uh, uh, that helps clarify. May I address that because I was referenced there? Um, I think I misspoke there. Uh, yeah, you, you did hear me correctly. Um, no, I don't think I would support it if it didn't have those conditions in. And the reason is, I, and I'm not going to get into debate here, but, 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 but I believe we're giving a lot up here and staff have recommended these safeguards and I will support staff in those safeguards. So I, no, I will not vote for it if uh, some or not all of those conditions are included. Dr. Pink? Well, I think, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Councilor Jagos, for that clarification. I think, unfortunately, what that means is you're back uh, to a dilemma. Uh, those councillors in support of the proposal don't agree with the restrictions and that vote may fail as a result. Uh, but if you read it without the restrictions, we know that that vote will also and fail. Um, so I believe uh, that in some respects may need to be resolved if you want to call the uh, call the vote. But I hope that's clear. Um, again, I'm happy to explain, but I believe that's the issue before you. Okay, so I'm not sure that's the issue. So before I'm going to get to you, Councillor Nishikawa, before I go any farther, do we have a straw vote that even that that we that that the majority of council wants to approve this in some form? So what I'm asking is yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So that's fine. Then the next question then does become: Do we want the the safeguards or restrictions that have been put in? Or do we not? And I need to I need to know that. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa, would you like to speak? 
Um, I suppose that I would like council um, or committee members to have a full understanding of how many more months that we will be delaying a decision on this property and allowing the property owners to move forward to the next step in their, um, the actions that they are allowed to do. Um, so interestingly, yes, we, we don't do third reading, uh, but the way that it's read is from what, I'm, what I've seen in the past and my knowledge of, of this type of writing is that in fact, we want them to take all of these things off their property before we give them third reading. But what happens when we come back and we say, well, we don't really like it today. We want you to do something different. So they've gone to all the expense and they've done all of the things, but in fact, we've taken away their ability to move forward to other avenues that would deal with this. Because certainly, I mean, we, we dealt with the property around the corner that was um, substantially like 9% over lot coverage. We dealt with it very differently than, than we're doing today. And I, I can list you a number of properties that seem to always come up on Rosso that we just sort of, oh, that's okay. You know, it's just only five feet here or there. You know, it's only that. But the reality is, is that this is a family that is trying to move forward in their life. And the fact that we need to have a timeline, I believe this council needs to understand if we vote on something today, with or without the restrictions, but then we're also saying, but by the way, we're not gonna give you third reading until you remove everything. But in fact, we still don't even know that we'll give you final reading. That's what I want people to understand because this has been going on since 2020. And I, I'm finding this, that is not the way that we should be doing our business. Well, it has been a long time. It's been an unusual situation, but I don't believe we have to deal with the, uh, we're not, we're going to withhold till third reading till we get to council. Um, Mayor Harding. Sorry, I just wanted to ask because you, um, you, you're saying that until it gets, but again, it goes back to my request please lay, that, lay out the timeline. So in fact, we're, we're asking them to remove everything from their property and then we might give them third reading. I wanna understand that better. And that's what my question was. There was a question mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. We only recommend Councillor Nishikawa and the decision goes to council. We can't make a final decision here. And I know you know that. So I don't know how to answer your question to be honest with you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much. The withholding of third reading, I believe, has become our standard practice within our planning uh, decisions these days that uh, we ask for buildings to be removed as our planning staff. That's their, um, their leverage, if you will, to authorize the final reading. The fact that we give two readings shows our intent to support this, um, that if anything went south. Uh, that the Lateos would certainly have thing. And I have never seen us undo a first yeah. and second reading. Um, yeah. So once we do first and second, we're moving down this road to do so. From a perspective of the uh, reductions that are being contemplated today in today's staff report as an alternative, I think Councillor Jagowitz's perspective, and I will agree with that same perspective, I would need those further reductions to support an application today. Without those reductions, if I was to revert back to the March timeframe, I cannot support this application. So uh, I'm happy to support the application with the additional reductions. We can move it on to council today. We would follow staff's recommendation that we're gonna give first and second, which tells the Lateos we're gonna move towards this. They remove parts of their buildings and then third reading is provided for them. So they get their zoning bylaw amendment at the end of the day. Um, I, if we don't want to include those in the resolution today, then I would have to vote against it. Thank you. Director Pink. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, again, I'm try trying to assist uh, getting to the finish line here. Um, what, uh, what we can do, there's no requirement to stipulate uh, prior to third reading 
in this resolution, if that helps us get through today, I can remove those references to prior to third reading. Ultimately though, at council, um, council will have to decide whether after first and second reading, uh, whether to give it a third or whether you wish to wait and to ensure those structures are removed. I just wanted to also make clear, staff's not recommending the alternative. We've laid it out as the alternative as what the Lateos have put forward as a proposal and uh, suggested that uh, if committee wanted to approve it, uh, that's before you. Uh, again, I, I sense the issue is uh, some agree with the restrictions uh, and some don't. Um, but again, if, if the confusion surrounds uh, entirely just third reading or not, um, we can remove that reference from the resolution and resolve that in a month's time uh, as to whether you want to give it three readings a month from now uh, or withhold third a month from now. Um, I think the recommendation would still be clear. You want those portions of the buildings or Sundex, et cetera, removed, or you don't. I think in my mind, that's really the key question that needs to be resolved. I think committee split on whether those have to be removed or not. Um, so I hope that helps. Councillor Zavitz, sorry, I was on mute. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and I, I go back to my <laughs> 28 minutes ago. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the staff report, table one. Table one, proposed April, 2022. Uh, I have the information in front of me, 2861, 2861, no change, not required. So why can't we just simply vote on that? It's what, what I'm very confused about, and I think others may well be, is that I, as you scroll down the page, all of a sudden there's analysis and then there's all of a sudden there's this thing called alternatives, which I've seen those alternatives many, many, many times, but we seldom uh, contemplate them. And all of a sudden I have the mayor and uh, Councillor Jagowitz saying they would only support the a vote in the affirmative on table one if they would, uh, if, if included in in the vote is all these alternatives. Are these alternatives baked into, from the Lateo's perspective, in uh, what is in table one, uh, April uh, proposal? I'm not sure what baked in means. The Lateos have agreed to those restrictions. Maybe I could ask Mr. Lateo to speak to this. Mr. Lateo, the, the alternatives that we're suggesting is basically the April the what what we got here in April, you have agreed that you would be willing to do those to have this passed. Yeah. So what's uh, in the site plan? For that, I believe that's what the uh, planning department recommended back then. Okay. Thank you. So that's what it is, Councillor Zavitz. They have agreed that they will do that. What we're what we're saying our conditions are. They they have agreed that they will do that to just further reduce it. From so, so the word isn't alternatives then the, 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 at all. The, the word should be um, in reference to table one uh, proposal, a proposed April 2nd column. The rationale is below and we're, I don't know, it should be called rationale. That's the reasoning behind the latest offering by the Lateos, which we're trying to vote on. Am I right? They, they're one and the same thing. Well, I, I, you can use your. They have your, to be one the same thing. But bottom line is, we can we we have the ability to do whatever we want. They are suggesting that these are things that would that that Latales have agreed to, and if we would like to have them in, we will have them in. But, but not in addition to what's in Table One, is that? No. Please clarify that. That, that is Table One, um, Mayor Hardy. Okay, well, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> table One. If I'm not mistaken, um, and I know I think uh, Mr. Pink can probably clarify, the recommendation in the staff report is to deny this. The alternative includes table one, April recommendations. We need to think of it that way. That is what the alternative is. Staff report says deny. The resolution that we're gonna contemplate today, hopefully read shortly, would include with the alternative section is the April consideration. Staff regularly also recommend we withhold third reading on these types of applications to ensure that they follow through what, with, what, what we have requested. And I think 
that's the only alternative. We have written it, I believe, in this resolution that we recommend to council that third reading is withheld. I'm happy with that resolution today. I'm also happy if we're going to pass it and debate it that we don't want to follow staff at council, but I think we have it to read, if I may. That's heavy lifting. <laughs> okay, so uh, Councillor Zavitz, I think I think I know. I think you're 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 good now, <laughs> Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And through you, uh, I guess I'm just going to beat the same bush because I'm misunderstood. Where the alternatives comes in, which is on page three of this four page report, is separate from what we're what we're being asked to approve today, I believe, isn't it? It's not baked into table one. It is the concessions that have been that that the Latales have agreed to for April. Well, the way so, I'm reading it, the way I'm reading it, it's 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 a it's a suggestion from the author of this report that, notwithstanding the fact that they reject the way it's originally proposed, we might consider a series of six bullets afterwards. But that's after we reject the first one. No, I, I'm, maybe I'm the structure okay, seems so, upside so, down. So, so, Councillor Kelly, I think to Mayor Harding's point, staff is saying reject this. I know. Okay. Yeah. So, the proposed April in Table 1, the proposed April numbers, whatever, to get to those numbers in April from March, that yeah. is what those all alternatives are. They simply describe the additional reductions that the Latales have agreed to from March to April. So all we're doing in this motion is saying, okay, we're, we're okay with those April numbers and we're, we are defining what that means within the motion. <clears throat> okay, I don't, all right. I don't think that's what this says, but uh, certainly I wasn't, well, I, I would have been voting on something other than what I guess I would have been voting on. <laughs> because this suggests to me immediately above table one, the table one is inclusive of changes that have been brought since March. And table one provides an overview of the further revised exemptions. Correct. And that's that the, what, I, my reading was the alternatives were, were even more in the way of a concession. So you know what that would probably help if it, if it was headed, if you, do not want to reject this motion, then here is what we suggest to support the changes that have already been made so far, I think. Councillor Edwards, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor, no, no, are I, you okay? I, well, I, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Councillor Edwards. Hopefully, that through the chair, as I understand it, we are voting on table one. It gets you down to 11.7% or 13.7 and that in the front yard and that and that other description is how they get down to that. So let's vote on table one, right. get them down to 11.7 uh, overall on the entire lot and 13.7 uh, on uh, the, the within 200 feet of the water, if that Excellent. helps. That's what we're voting on and let's get with it and call the vote, thank you. Excellent way to describe it. So thank you everybody for your help on that. Okay, no other comments. I am going to read this motion. Um, and and so Councillor Zavitz, have you taken back your recorded vote? I just want to make sure I've got everything. No, I think we should have a, thank you for that. I think we should have a recorded vote and I'm, I'm happy to go last. Like I always do. <laughs> you always do. Okay, all right. Um, Moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Kelly, be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Town Council that official plan amendment 54 and zoning bylaw amendments that be A-22-20, Lateo, roll number 6-4-046 be approved subject to the proposed removal of the covered roof, uh, sun decks, covered roof and roof entry associated with the as-built dwelling and garage prior to third reading of bylaw 2020-103, resulting in a maximum of 2,286 
861.3 square feet of lot coverage over the areas of the entire lot bracket, that's 11.7%, and within 200 feet from the high water mark, which is 13.7%. The proposed reduction in cumulative width of the as-built as dock to at least 15.4 feet prior to the third reading of the bylaw 2020-103 the proposed removal of the upper level sun deck attached to the two-story garage prior to, two, to third reading of bylaw 2020-103, the proposed removal of the sun deck in the front yard area and incorporation into Riverstones for vegetation plan prior to third reading of bylaw 2020-103, that the property and as-built development be made subject to site plan control in order to implement Riverstones for vegetation plan and enhance protection policies of the district official plan as necessary and that corresponding amendments to OPA 54, I don't think I needed to read that, Mr. Mr. Pink, but corresponding amendments to OPA 54 and bylaw 2020-103 be made. So uh, if anybody is really upset about the third reading part, we can remove that, but it, it's, we are going to have another chance at council to look at that. That's when we'll make that final decision. Councillor Nishikawa. Well, in fact, I thought I had heard Director Pink say he can remove prior to third reading. Uh, I would like that removed. I thought it was going to, I didn't think we were going to read it today. I thought it, from his comments that it would be removed. Well, I think we're, are we all in agreement with that so we can get this moved on to council? Can I see a no, uh, Mayor Harding is not in agreement with us. So, Mayor Harding. Uh, sorry, um, our planning staff are recommending their conformity to ensure that uh, changes are made. We do it on every other application these days. So, uh, if that is going to be removed from this bylaw, I would or this recommendation, I would not support it. Whoops, sorry, Councillor Jagowitz. Well, first of all, I, I support uh, Mayor Harding, but <laughs> yeah, I, 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 like I, I, these conditions have to be in, but whether the third reading is in, I believe the third reading should be there. Uh, but Phil, do you want this to fail today because of that? Not the third reading, Councillor Jagowitz. We don't do that. This is strictly. Yeah, but he he uh, the proposal is to remove it from this resolution. Like I'm happy with the resolution the way it is. Okay, and 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 I think what what staff are saying at council, you can still council can still read it a third time if they choose, right? Okay, so. Uh, so I'm, I have read it with, with the uh, prior to third reading, which is how it stands now. It uh, is not in stone. It can change at council. I, I think I'm reading that we want to progress with the third reading still in. And I, I have that. Councillor Kelly, you're good. Progress with the third, with this re reading still in. Okay, that's how we're going people. So I have read the motion. Is there any more discussion? Then I believe, uh, Madam Clerk, it is up to you to do the recorded vote. Okay. So Councillor Zavitz has requested a recorded vote in uh, regular order, I believe. So Councillor Bridgman. No. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Mayor Harding. Yes. Councillor Jagowitz. Yes. Councillor Kelly. Yes. Councillor Mazan. No. Councillor Nishikawa. Yes. Councillor Roberts. Yes. 
Councillor Hayes. Yes. Councillor Zabit. Yes. That is carried. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I know that was long. And so, uh, Lateos, this will be moving to council next month. Okay. Thank you. So, next, uh, I'm going to Mr. I believe Mr. Sift is here to delegate. If we could bring him in, Elizabeth. And this is, there's nothing on our agenda for this. Uh, it is in, well, I think I'll let him explain to you what he's delegating about. Welcome, Mr. Sift. Thank you, Chair Richmond. I appreciate your time. You guys are all tired, so you want to go home. So I'll make this brief. Just your address, too, and then please go ahead. Of course. Philip Sift. 1118 Hamels Point Road, uh, Muskoka, uh, Muskoka Mactier, actually, POC 1HO. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillors. Thank you, Mayor um, and staff, for the time you're giving me this afternoon. I'll be brief. Um, purpose of, of, of my meeting with you now is to seek a reduction in the site plan a securities holdback uh, for uh, the development that we're building on uh, at 156 Medora Street, three apartment buildings, 36 units. We're in construction now. Uh, we have um, the first building is half done. Uh, we expect occupancy July 1st. Uh, we have paid up to date $105,630 uh, dollars um, in security holdback for that pro part of the project. And we have decided that um, we'd like to go ahead with the next two apartments, get them started, get the site plans approved. Um, the biggest reason is, um, and one of the other reasons is, I'd like to get them all going um, because of the need in the community. But to do that, we need um, um, approval from district to, to uh, get the services agreement um, completed for the next two apartments. And they will not let us do that until we have an active site plan approval. Um, our original plan was to, um, I should actually go back just a little bit and ask you uh, my ask. Um, the township site plan costs for the next two phases. The first one was 105, 630. The next two and three is 212, 250, which comes to 317,880. And what I'm asking for is to receive a 66 reduction, a 66 percent reduction in the development fees for the next two apart, so we can uh, go on for the next two apartments. Um, uh, which that means is each apartment then will have um, for all three apartments will be a total of $105,630 for all three apartments. Um, I'd like to comment on the project. I think it has merit for the community. Um, I want to start the project, the next two apartments as quickly as possible. Um, I see that there's um, need in our community for them. And I think it's a wise to get going on them as quickly as we can. Um, there's value in me doing it all, all the site work at once. Um, and we're in the process of getting the contractors in to do the service work. And I would like to be able to do all the service work for all three apartments um, at the same time, if possible. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments again about the project. The project is not restricted by site plan alteration bylaws. We can move forward with the site prep now, but again, can't complete the services until the services design is approved by district, which means we will have to do the subgrade work twice. The original plan was to build and complete and occupy one apartment at a time request the return of securities to start the second apartment, then once completed, request the return of securities to start the third apartment. This method takes longer, but it's more affordable from a development perspective, but pushes the project completion till at least the fall of 24. So um, we feel that there's a huge demand now and feel it's a benefit to Port Carling and the area to have all th 36 units available um, by the, possibly the summer, fall of 23, if, if we can do the start now with all of the applications and everything involved. Um, 
here's the recommendation for this, if it's possible, it, um, just maybe to help understand how this could work. Um, I recommend that the security holdback reduction is as requested, that the apartment one will not receive occupancy till inspection is complete and all the development conditions are met. Next, apartment two will not receive occupancy till inspection is completed and all the development conditions are met. Next, apartment three will not receive occupancy till inspections are completed and development conditions are met. Next means to me is that once the first apartment is completed, it cannot be occupied until all of the site plan requirements and holdback securities of the 105 are met. Then that what I, then basically then we could go to the next one being number two and nothing could be done on occupied in that building until all of the site plan requirements are completed. And then the third apartment, then the same thing. Not, we couldn't occupy until everything is completed and all of the site requirements are completed. The timeline and methods of inspection will be planned with staff and developer to ensure quick occupancy as requested. Securities holdbacks of the 105 630, which has already been paid, will be held till all three apartments are completed, inspected, and occupancy granted. That was a long version. It was as quickly as I could make it. So, uh, so you really are there any to, questions? You want to roll all your securities over to each one rather than have to come up with securities for each building. That's what I'm gathering. Yes, but what I'd like to do is roll them into each one, but I'd like to be able to put the applications in for all three apartments now. Okay, I understand. Uh, Mayor Hardy? Thank you. I think I just clarified, it, uh, Mr. Sift, you made a comment that uh, development charges or development fees as opposed to securities. And I think it's the securities that you're looking to use the current $105,000 to maintain all three. And that uh, you're also willing to say you won't provide occupancy until one, two or three, until all the works are actually done. So we could do a paperwork back and forth, give back money, do whatever. Let's just, let's get these three apartments built as far as I'm concerned. So I'm totally in favor of that. And I'm not sure how we would move that forward with uh, maybe it's just direction to staff. Okay, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I, I, my experience in other municipalities, I will say Gravenhurst and Huntsville in particular, are, are much more creative with their development charges and, and also other charges involved. Uh, that's why they keep building more. We in Muskoka Lakes have not had the experience of someone coming forward and saying, we're gonna build 36 units uh, that is affordable housing or attainable or anywhere for anyone to live, quite frankly. Um, and, and so I would hope that staff is gonna come back with a full report for council. Uh, I would be happy to move this forward to council and that um, we can move something forward. Uh, having said that, again, our municipality has not, in my opinion, been very creative over a number of years of getting housing built in Muskoka Lakes. And, and someone is willing to do this, so I think we have to look at it very clearly, closely, and, um, and, and again, uh, encourage other developers as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jagrowitz. Yes, I have a question for uh, the applicant and then uh, to staff. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the district. Uh, are these uh, township uh, security deposits or are you muddling the district with this too? Mr. Um, no, I'm not muddling them at all. So what these securities are, there's two portions. The one security uh, for the district that they will, I will have to pay with them. They actually offer, uh, without me even asking, they actually offered a 33% discount on the original development. I have no idea what they're going to do right now because they won't talk to me until I have an active SPA uh, site plan approval process in place. I don't know what they will do. I'm dealing just with the Township of Muskoka Lakes okay. Security. I just wanted to clarify paving. that because I am aware that the district does provide some flexibility. and But how it normally works... Uh, uh, Philip, as you normally work this out with staff and then staff come forward with a proposal to us. It sounds like this is your plan. So I would uh, go along with uh, the previous councillor that uh, that staff should work with you to come up with some proposal that that, that works for both of us. I, I'm just surprised that you haven't worked this out with staff. I, I, I have actually had a conversation with David Pink um, and, and we talked about this and... Um, okay. 
Yeah. yeah. So he he suggested that I come forward to <laughs> to to this committee to talk about it and pr present the proposal. They he, they've been very supportive, and he's okay. been very supportive. So I have no pro I have no problem at all with planning. They've been great. Bryce has been great all along and you know, the student staff. So there's no problems at all here. Um, they suggested I come this way so that we can get the process going. And that was, this was the best way to expedite it. He felt, they felt. Okay. Well, that, that's fine. So maybe David, you can, can something come forward for council as was suggested. Mr. Pink. Thank you, sir. Just to help uh, clarify the situation. Uh, when this zoning amendment and severance was before planning committee and council previously, and it was approved, council delegated the authority to approve the site plan to staff. So staff has approved phase one and Mr. Sift has submitted securities. I can't speak to the district agreement uh, or development charges, um, but I know standard agreements with the township, we don't require uh, occupancy to return the security. Um, as soon as any work is completed, we can return that work. Um, so this matter doesn't have to come back to council or planning committee. It's been delegated to staff and staff's happy to approve phase two and three when they're applied for. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Siff, but I believe the request is essentially looking for similar to what the district does is not a collection of hundred percent of the security. It is the township standard practice though, to collect uh, the entire amount. Uh, and I would be looking to uh, planning committee direction, similar to as how you delegated Approval to staff, if planning committee is comfortable with collecting a lesser amount, staff will take that uh, direction, but it is our uh, standard process to collect a full amount, 100% of the security. Sorry, so, I see. I see. I'm. I was on mute. I think Mr. Siff uh, suggested we've already got securities for the first one. We can we uh, he, he once he gets occupancy and and has everything then we'll just I think it's called roll it over rather than reduce rates but that's my misunderstanding Councillor Hayes thank you through you um, I would support a reduced rate and an agreement between uh, Mr Sift and our staff is uh, good enough for me okay so. Um, Councillor Nishikawa and Councillor Edwards, and then I think we're, well, no, and then Mayor Harding. Councillor Nishikawa. Um, so what I heard from the applicant and what I heard from David Pink were two separate things. Um, the applicant came in with specific numbers that he was talking about. And that's why I wanted to see a resolution come forward because quite frankly, I believe something like this does, does, does deserve a resolution. So there's no misunderstanding of what counselors are saying or we're reading the room, whatever that looks like. But the point is, is that he specifically talked about certain numbers. And I, I don't want um, this particular applicant at this time to have to negotiate those with staff. I, I believe it's important for it to come in front of council. And so then we have something in place that we said, okay, we approved this for this particular applicant. Well, the next developer that comes along, we can, if it's, is it all similar and things like that, we can then uh, have something to go by. But I, I'm a little bit concerned that we, we as council may not know what um, staff have, decided with this applicant other than the applicant coming back saying geez I was either annoyed or happy whichever way but I thought that it was important to come back to council for that reason okay because uh, it was specifically the the dollar numbers were quite a bit different than what David was suggesting okay thank you councillor Edwards uh, thank you very much I can support a um, reduced uh, securities on, on this 105,000 for each uh, building when they, and that let's get them going, let's get them occupied. So I would support uh, what, what uh, and that Mr. Swift is uh, actually uh, proposing. Thank you. Mayor Harding. Thank you. I, just uh, to clarify what I think I heard, 
and I think Mr. Ziff got into a lot of technical detail and numbers and everything that might have helped confuse us <laughs> or not. Um, what, what I believe the ask in, in general I heard is that you we're holding right now, call it a third of the development of the fee securities for all three buildings, but you're saying let that one third be su sufficient to manage all three buildings. So we keep the 105,000 and we allow you to continue on with buildings two and three without collecting additional securities, the specific terms of which would be negotiated with uh, Mr. Pink. Um, so in, in round numbers to me, that's a 66% reduction if you want to take numbers. Um, and, uh, you know, is 105,000 enough to keep this thing moving forward? To me, that's enough money to move it forward. I don't know, uh, staff report to come back to the same. I think that's generally what the ask is, if I'm not mistaken. That, that is the ask. Okay. All right. So, uh, are we, uh, Councillor Hayes? Uh, thank you. Through you to Mr. Sift. Um, how quickly do you need some kind of an answer from us? Because if we have to take this to council, uh, it will be another month. Are you looking for us to uh, delegate to staff today to keep the ball rolling or can you wait the month to have it official? I would prefer to have it now because I have the, the site plan applications ready to submit. Um, and I can't, I haven't been able to put them in because we, we put it to this meeting to, to make that decision if possible. And again, I'm not twisting arms here. I, I, I realize there's protocols and so I wanna respect everybody here and do what what's best but the quicker i can get it the better because then we can start you know i i, I the the whole spa process which does take time so okay mr pink uh, thank you chair the thank you uh, the delegate uh, can submit site plan uh, any day now uh, certainly staff will try to expedite that as soon as possible uh, but i think it likely will take probably likely the month that would get to council. What staff can do is bring forward a resolution to council if, uh, as per Councillor Nishikawa's request, if that's agreed upon, uh, that would simply direct staff to take, uh, as Mayor Harding's pointed out, uh, that percentage of security or essentially that the security collected be sufficient for the entire build out. Um, uh, so I'm happy to bring that resolution forward. And if Mr. Siff makes the site plan application, uh, hopefully in a perfect world, all is approved in about a month's time and, and we can get going. Excellent suggestion. Don't, okay. uh, maybe just to clarify for Mr. Siff, we don't require the security to be paid up front when you make the application. Um, you can work with us, work through the application, and then when you're ready to sign, uh, we can take the, take the actual funds. So that should uh, hopefully line up well by May's meeting perhaps, and council can uh, direct if you wish to have a resolution. Otherwise, I'm comfortable taking the uh, verbal direction today uh, to not require securities for phase two and three. Okay. Uh, can I have a general feeling? Would we like a, I, I'm gathering from Mr. Siff's standpoint, it, he's going to get to the finish line at the same time. So would we like to have a resolution next month? How many are in favor of that? Okay, so I think I think we will do that. Uh, to Councilor Nishikawa's point, that, that uh, cements it for us. So thank you, Mr. Pink. You can bring that to us uh, next uh, next month. And Mr. Siff, you can carry on. Um, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, just to, as I was following along um, with this, I, I, this is an, 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 a newer situation for us in the township. And what I heard from some of my colleagues is that there's different practices when these types of things come forward. And I always have comfort when our staff have a policy or something to fall back on. And I'm just wondering, is that something that we need to be, to be looking at? Um, like I've, ref I've heard that the district does things in certain ways. Gravenhurst does things in certain ways. It's not like we get a lot of these kind of large scale uh, developments, but I guess I'm just asking the question, is this something we should be putting on? I, I hate to say it, the to-do list, uh, but the, it, 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 it it seems like we've ju we're just making a decision here. Okay, so Mr. Pink, do you see value in a policy for that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, staff can certainly explore that. I, uh, to be uh, honest with committee, I think taking the full security for the developments we typically see 
uh, which is single lot redevelopment uh, and ensuring that those works are completed uh, is the prudent approach. I think um, the purpose for the security is if a property owner doesn't complete the work, the municipality needs the funds to both uh, acquire the materials and the labor to complete the work. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, typically recommend to you to take a lesser amount. It is a potential risk. Uh, other municipalities may decide that uh, 70, 80, 90% is sufficient. Um, again, happy to take direction, uh, but I think taking 100% has served us well. Uh, the other aspect I find in our operations, uh, very rarely, if ever, do we actually need to utilize the security. Uh, but part of that reason is because we take a larger amount. Uh, what we find actually is sometimes when we take a too small amount, uh, property owners don't complete the work because there's no incentive to do so. They're happy to uh, uh, just pay the uh, get out of jail free card. So uh, I would suggest you we continue at 100%. That's been our longstanding informal policy. Uh, but if council or committee uh, wishes, uh, staff's happy to investigate uh, a policy. Okay, are you good, Councillor Mazan? Yes, like I, I just I wanted to separate this conversation from what uh, from Mr. Sif's ask, because clearly we, we all want to support this initiative and want to support getting further housing, uh, knowing that housing is an issue here in the township. I, I'm just thinking, OK, I, I think I, what it just has happened here is two hundred thousand dollars is the number that's floating in my head and we're rolling numbers over. I'm just listening to a situation and I'm always feeling a bit better having things in writing. And I, that's why I wanted to support Councillor Nishikawa's request for a resolution when things are captured. So uh, I'm opening up the discussion to the group to say, is this something we think we need to have more? Uh, and I'm struggling for the word, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's a uh, policy. I think that's where you, you started. Think, yeah. Is that something that we think we need uh, to support uh, housing like this or not and I'm not saying it's an urgent thing because these things don't come up on our agenda very often but uh, it would wow. seem like it would be helpful. All right well we'll see if there's any uptake. Uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes just briefly chair I do support the last two councillors who are asking for a policy because I think I did hear Mr. Sitt say the district possibly offers a third, he's asking two thirds here. So, so maybe we do need to, 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 to think about it. Although I think we all agreed we would like to uh, offer something. So uh, possibly something can come forward uh, to council next. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Pink, put that on your list. I think is what, what we're hearing um, for when, whenever. So, okay. So we will have, um, we'll have a resolution next, uh, next month, Mr. Seth. So thank you for Chair, your delegation. Chair Bridg Bridgman, thank you very much for your time. And council, thank you. Staff, thank you. And happy Easter to everybody. Okay. All right. So I, I know we've been here for um, since one o'clock. Uh, we have one report from David, and then I believe we're finished unless there's new business. Would anybody like a break right now? Okay. I just want to check in. All right. So, um, Mr. Pink, you have your report on more Homes for Everyone Act, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the last report uh, on today's agenda begins on page 394 in your packages. Uh, the province has put uh, a posting up on uh, Bill 109 looking for comments. Uh, I've provided some background on the province's objectives uh, with the new bill. It's titled More Homes for Everyone Act. Uh, really the province is looking to increase the supply of housing uh, in the province provided some interesting benchmarking statistics uh, for you um, the reason for doing so is in the province's presentation on the bill uh, they referenced this study and some of the uh, statistics from it in their reasoning for uh, the uh, some of the changes under bill 109 uh, and then quickly gone over the more uh, notable changes to the planning act uh, that's proposed uh, the majority of with, I, I don't particularly have a great concern with, but I can quickly go over with you. Uh, first, uh, in regards to site plan control, uh, the uh, bill proposes that it become mandatory that site plans be delegated to staff. I think, uh, again, as, as uh, councillors likely are aware, the vast majority of site plans are already uh, delegated to staff. Uh, this would mean even those uh, larger commercial proposals uh, would be. Uh, staff's not opposed to this. 
I think uh, the message uh, I hope it does send uh, to the community and, and council is the very technical nature uh, of site plan applications. It's a very uh, technical exercise going through uh, zoning compliance uh, and various other requirements to ensure uh, that uh, uh, the development of the site is done in an appropriate way. Um, the other uh, is in regards to uh, uh, the main uh, really change, in my opinion, that I think we raised some objection to is in regard to application timelines. And the province is proposing through this bill that if municipalities do not uh, complete uh, decisions on uh, various types of applications, in particular zoning and site plans, that the municipalities will actually have to refund applicants. Uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, the province is a little misguided, or at least uh, I don't believe this is the issue uh, in the District of Muskoka or the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Um, I don't believe it's the municipality holding up uh, site plan approval or the building of housing. Uh, frankly, or simply, uh, we just don't see uh, many, if any, of proposals for uh, new housing stock. So um, can't speak for uh, larger urban settings in the GTA, um, but I don't think uh, again, incentivizing um, or basically encouraging council to make um, you know faster decisions is necessarily going to result in added housing. I think if anything, it's going to result in more of an administrative burden uh, and more of budget impacts uh, on our ratepayers uh, for refunding fees. If anything, uh, to be honest, I think we have a bit of an opposite problem in the district of Muskoka, where uh, a number of plans of subdivisions sit uh, for lengthy periods of time. Uh, and developers don't act on them. As Mayor Harding, I believe, uh, pointed out at council yesterday and perhaps earlier today, we have a number of long-standing approvals that are tying up septic capacity in our sewage treatment plants across the district. Uh, I'd rather see instead of us uh, refunding zoning applications, uh, we should be able to post penalties on developers for not building out their approvals in a timely fashion. We seem to have the, the opposite problem here. So I think, long story short, uh, my message is I think um, I don't believe it's municipalities that are holding up the housing. Uh, there's other issues that perhaps the province can concentrate on. Um, and again, there's some uh, other relatively minor changes uh, with respect to more transparency for development charges and more funding for the Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, but staff does have some concerns with the refund of fees and feel it is appropriate to comment to the province uh, that we are opposed to that. And the recommendation is to forward this report in response to the posting. And with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions, committee? Okay, then I'm going to read the motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that staff report plan 2022-74 be forwarded to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing as the Township's response to their request for comments to Bill 109, the More Homes for Everyone Act. Any comments? All in favor? Okay, thank you very much, David, for that report. All right, I think we're down to uh, new business. Is there anybody who has any new business? Okay, then we're down to adjournment. All right, so uh, I'm going to uh, read this then, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that planning committee meeting adjourn at 3.36 p.m. and the next regular planning committee meeting will be held Thursday, May 12th, 2022 at 9 a.m. electronically from the Council Chamber of Municipal Offices in Port Carling, Ontario. All in favor? Okay, so thank you everyone. It was a tough meeting today, I know. So I really appreciate uh, all of you. And I hope you all have a really, really nice Easter week.